Well, we have here today uh, George Comstock, uh, and he's going to tell us something about uh, uh, his, his story of his career in the uh, computer field and also that of his partner, uh, Andy Gabor. Uh, this is an oral history tape for the Computer History Museum's Oral History Project. Uh, George, I think I'd probably like to start really far back, uh, sort of where, where you grew up, where you were born and grew up. Well, gosh, um, if you were to ask my wife that question, she might answer that I never have grown up. <laughs> but uh, taking it in a more literal sense, uh, I was born in Canandaigua, New York, but only lived there for a year, so I have relatively little memory of it. My first memories really are of Worcester, Massachusetts, where my parents moved when I was five years old. So I grew up in Worcester. And um, I was about nine years old when I got acquainted with the older brother of one of my playmates. This guy's uh, name was Al Howell. He lived uh, across the street from where I lived. And he, at the age of 15, was an avid model airplane builder. So he got me involved at the age of nine in learning how to build model airplanes. And that became quite a, quite a career for me during uh, grammar school and high school. I must have built several hundred models before I was done, including maybe a hundred gas models. And oh my lost, goodness. Lost a few in cumulus clouds, you know. <laughs> you know <the laughs> All of that, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, now the, so that got me started on an engineering career, okay. really. That's why I mention it, because he went on to go to uh, school at Worcester Tech, became a mechanical engineer. And young George figured there couldn't be anything better to do than what Al Howell did. So I went to Worcester Tech and became a mechanical engineer. I graduated in 1942 with a BS in mechanical engineering. So that's, or, how, you, yeah. that's how you got started. Uh, that's how that. I got started. Now, could you just give me a little bit, I just want to roll back a little bit, the background of your, did you have brothers and sisters? I had a sister who was born when I was 12 years old, ah. so I really didn't develop much of a relationship with her until her adult years. Okay, so you really grew up more or less as an only child. I was as an only child. As an only child. Now, what did your parents uh, do? My mother was um, a traditional housewife and a fundamentalist uh, in terms of religion. My father was uh, a newspaper advertising salesman and a heavy drinker, and I suppose those two kind of go together, the fundamentalist and the drinker. Um, so that was the household I grew up in. My dad was uh, disappointed with me in many respects. He was an avid fisherman and liked to use his shotgun for hunting, and I wasn't interested in either of those activities. So we had relatively little in common. I went my way and kind of ignored what he did. And uh, he went his way and kind of ignored what the family did. Okay. And so you got more of your inspiration to go to engineering school from your friend. Came from Al Howell. Came from your friend, who? Yeah. Who became a suspension engineer for a Mack Truck Company. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, the, uh, did you, when do you think you decided you really, that you wanted to become an engineer? When did that dawn on you? I suppose I didn't realize there was such a thing as an engineer until Al Howe went off to Worcester Tech to study to become one. Okay. And it was clear to me that uh, my interest lay in that direction. So. How old was he? How much older was he than you? Uh, well, when I first met him, he was 15 and I was 9. Ah, so six years older. Yeah. Okay. So you had plenty of time to watch him at Worcester Tech and say, oh, yeah, all right. Uh, actually, most of my contact with him was before he went to Worcester Tech. When he got to Tech, he became deeply embedded in his homework, and I saw relatively little of him. Then he discovered girls, and I just saw even less of him. <laughs> However, uh, there's remained a tie in that uh, I've remained um, closely connected with his younger brother, Harvey. And in fact, uh, just last week, Harvey and his wife, Debbie, who grew up in our neighborhood, and my wife and I were on a sailboat in uh, Rockland, Maine, with the two of them. So we've, we've been in touch for a good many decades. That is going back Isn't very it? early yeah. in your life. All right. Yeah. And friends that you just kept. Just as an aside, the um, experience in Rockland was um, 
a good test of our friendship because uh, we got out in a 40-foot uh, uh, O'Day uh, and the first night was, um, we, we arrived late in the day and got out to a mooring in Rockland Harbor. And the next morning, everything was fogged in solid. And in fact, we sat there uh, on the mooring, really, for uh, four days, waiting for the fog to lift, which it never did, and then we came home. <laughs> we did get off the mooring just twice. We did a partial foray, thinking we might get over to Vinyl Haven, but uh, the GPS led us out into the, the middle of the waters between the two, about three miles out, and we never did see the buoy that we were aiming for with the GPS. <laughs> And so we turned around and did a reverse course on the compass to get back to our mooring and fortunately found it. And then another day we did a brief run uh, up along the breakwater and into Glen Cove and then back, but it was so foggy it was just very uncomfortable. Foghorns blasting all over and you never know when the ferry's going to appear 150 feet away headed straight for you and <laughs> so on. So uh, we discovered that we were really good friends because we could endure this uh, experience for the full four days without once, uh, not, not even one cruel word. Or <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is very good. Yeah, it worked yes, out well. Very good. That fog was dense enough, so one time Harvey and I made, a, made our way into the um, town dock in our dinghy to, to get some supplies, and we got lost trying to find the boat again. <laughs> lost in the fog. But we stayed amidst boats, so uh, we you knew do, we were you going to find it eventually. In. It was yes. kind of a random walk until we got to it. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, let's. Uh, so you majored in mechanical engineering, right? Any particular specialty in mechanical engineering? Oh yeah, I majored in aero. You see, I'd been building all these model airplanes, ah, so aero okay. was a very natural major. Okay. And um, the job I accepted on graduation was uh, at Grumman Aircraft in Long Island. And I worked there as a junior engineer for six months. Now, when was this? What This what was years? 1942, right toward the end of World War II. Ah, okay. I'd had a deferment during most of the war as a student, engineering student deferment. And I got called up uh, in the draft uh, toward the end, but they discovered a punctured eardrum and decided I wouldn't be suitable for the Army. So that permitted me to finish the, the college work. Okay, very good. Now, did you have other, uh, were there other school, uh, other places you, you applied to and you thought of going to work? No. No? no. Just, just uh, sometime during my senior year in high school, I went over and had a chat with Dean Howe, the Dean of Admissions at Worcester Tech, and um, he told me he thought I had a pretty good chance of getting in, and uh, it worked. Okay. <laughs> I graduated second in my class there. I see. All right. So, yes. I was beaten out by a guy that uh, got 0.01 percentage points above my grade point average. <laughs> he went to work for Pratt Whitney, so I guess Pratt Whitney got the cream of the crop. <laughs> <laughs> I think Grumman had some pretty high standards in those days. <laughs> anyway, I stayed at Grumman for six months, and I was immersed in a sea of drafting tables. And I had my own drafting table, of course. I was a junior engineer. Um, they didn't put me to work uh, designing uh, wing ribs or anything like that. I, I was assigned to an autopilot project that they had going. There was an outside inventor who had conceived a pneumatic autopilot, and Grumman was trying to commercialize it. And um, so I was doing some experimental work with that thing, um, building rocking platforms and the like that we could do some uh, testing of it before putting it in an airplane and the like. But um, in addition to these acres of drawing tables, there, was all, there were also acres of desks with uh, desk calculators on them, each manned by a woman. And the women were the computers in that company. Mm -hmm. And uh, toward the end of 1942, um, I received an offer from the Norton Company in, back in Worcester, my hometown, to join a diamond synthesis project as a mechanical engineer designing high-pressure vessels for diamond synthesis work. And that seemed so much more romantic than these acres of drafting tables that I left the aircraft industry, left it behind, and went into, what would you call it, materials science. Yes, okay. Um, we were, I was designing pressure vessels that would work at uh, 30,000 atmospheres with temperatures of 1,000 degrees centigrade 
and uh, we were beaten to the to the uh, successful conclusion of this work by GE, who adopted a different approach. They worked at uh, pressures up to 60,000 atmospheres or so, with a much less well-controlled temperature environment, but they succeeded. Um, we had done one experiment of trying to make a 60,000 atmosphere vessel with 1,000 degrees centigrade temperature, and it broke on the first run, of course, and um, there just wasn't money or time to, to uh, pursue that any further. But uh, GE, with its uh, simpler anvil approach, uh, succeeded. Wow. And okay. in fact, in later years, they used to love to demonstrate their diamond making process by putting a little peanut butter on the press and uh, converting the peanut butter into diamonds. <laughs> it, was, it was a very romantic subject. In fact, a book has been written on it that uh, even mentions the work that was being done at Norton. Okay. So um, uh, I worked on that project for three years at Norton Company. And um, then they were kind enough to grant me a sabbatical uh, at pay which at that time was like a little over $3,000 a year. And I used that to go off to Caltech to get a uh, master's degree in physics. Oh, and meanwhile, during those three years, uh, Norton had permitted me to take courses part-time at Worcester Tech during the day. And I uh, developed a, a BS in electrical, engineer by the electrical engineering by that process. Oh, all and right. Then when the sabbatical came along, uh, tried to tie the whole thing together with uh, a year of study of physics. And that was really quite interesting. I loved that. Okay. So when I came back, I transferred to Norton's grinding machine division and began developing, um, you might say, more advanced instrumentation and control techniques for their grinding machines. We answered some uh, fundamental questions that had been um, um, topics of conversation at Norton for some time. For example, they made cam grinders that would grind the camshafts on automobiles. Now, one of the shibboleths of uh, grinding was that there's an optimum uh, relative speed between the grinding wheel and the, and the work that it's working on, the surface of the work. And of course, in grinding a cam, uh, which has a large radius at one end and a very tiny radius at the other, that um, speed of the grinding wheel over the surface of the work varies very substantially during the rotation of the cam and the grinding process. Well, they thought that they'd get better cams if they could somehow make that uh, relative velocity constant. So one of the projects I did was to um, outfit a cam grinder with a hydraulic drive motor for the spindle rotation to rotate the work, programmed it with a cam that would uh, uh, vary its speed with a uh, uh, variable valve so that it maintained more or less constant surface speed during the rotation of the cam and it made no difference whatever in the way the cam turned out. So we, we got that settled. Um, so what's the connection with computing? Well, I had to design a cam that would rotate with the headstock that would control the valve that metered oil to the hydraulic motor to control the speed. And um, that involved quite a serious calculation that among other things took into account the um, elasticity of the hydraulic pipes that connected the valve to the drive motor and so on. And um, the tool that I found uh, very useful in doing that kind of computation was the IBM card program calculator the IBM CPC, which All right. was a fairly early effort by IBM. Yes. Um, it was um, one instruction per punched card. The machine itself was uh, plug board programmed, and one of the IBM techs set up a, a plug board for me that had all the math functions on it, trig and so forth. So I was able to call for the sine of this angle, the tangent of that angle and multiply these and add those and store them away. The storage was a relay bank that would hold 24 numbers. Uh, and the machine would chunk a chunk a chunk through the, my deck of cards and I'd keep recycling because of course it had to make a, make a calculation for each degree of the rotation. And um, 
the, the amusing part of all this was that uh, I had to complete my calculations in 20 minutes. I had to do a cycle in 20 minutes because that was the mean time between failure of that IBM CPC as I experienced it. They had a full-time resident service engineer on site and I'd grind through a calculation and then the next one it would quit and the guy would come over and fix it up and then I'd get through the next stage and so on. So that was, oh my, that was my first experience with uh, computers per se up to that time. I'd, uh, well, at Grumman, I was using a slide roll, and uh, in the early years at, um, at uh, Norton Company, I was using a, a desk calculator, mechanical desk calculator. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right. That's pretty interesting. So where do we go from there? That was um, Norton experience. After 10 years with Norton, I had uh, designed one product that the sales department had expressed some interest in. In fact, uh, this was this a research area, or this is this just- It's called research and development. This is research and development. This is where the products were developed. Yeah. Okay. Now, in the grinding machine division, what they were developing was grinders. Right. And uh, for example, they built a grinder that would grind the rolls and steel mills. These were machines that were probably 50 feet long. The rolls that they were grinding were 20 or 30 feet long, and they'd be several feet in diameter. And uh, the way they'd align the machine would be to stretch a piece of piano wire from one end to the other, really tight, mount a microscope on the moving table, and uh, with a reticle, observe uh, the, the, uh, pian the stretched piano wire and determine whether or not their carriage is running true. And if it's not running true, they'd correct it with a scraper, a hand scraper. They'd take a little bit of cast iron off the ways in the right place to get it to run straight. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so that's all right. <laughs> yeah, it's probably going back to the uh, early days of the, the, the constructing railroad locomotives. Exactly, or something. or something like that. It was fun, but um, the one product that uh, finally satisfied a market need was this. It was a device for aligning the tables on a tool room grinder. Tool room grinder table could swivel to to generate tapered work on a on a round. A uh, piece of work held between centers, so you could get it tapered by swiveling the table. And um, competitor Brown and Sharp had um, come out with uh, a gadget that um, put some kind of electronic measuring device on one end of the swivel table and displayed its movement on a, a needle, and it was micrometer sensitive, so that the end, the uh, um, operator of the machine could grind a trial piece, measure its taper and then make very small adjustments against uh, an electronic needle that would tell him how much he was moving and he could get it, uh, well, the way the machinist used to put it was get it dead nuts. Okay, yes. So we needed, uh, we thought we needed a device that would compete with that and uh, they had a patent on that so I came up with an improvement which put a uh, linear variable differential transformer at each end of the table and so I was able to measure the movement at each end of this swivel table. And I displayed it on a meter that Simpson built for me that was a special meter that had two meter movements with coaxial structure. So they had two needles that operated around the same axis and you could see them in the same field of view, running, reading against the same scale. And the beauty of that was that I'm measuring the displacement at each end of this table. And if the table bends during the process, the needles won't move together. They'll go slightly off. So the, the machinist could tell not only overall how much he was moving, but how much each end of the table was moving separately. And if he wanted to, he could straighten that out and so on and so forth. So that, that was my contribution to the product uh, lineup at Norton Company. Um, interestingly, when we... Uh, uh, first got this thing developed, the sales departments had decided they didn't really need it, so we put it under the, on the shelf under the table. And it was about six months later they came around and said, well, we've been losing some sales, so didn't you develop something that would uh, help us on this table alignment oh. thing? And Can we dust that off? Yes. <laughs> so I think they ultimately built something like 50 of these things. It used a twin triode to amplify the signal and so on and so forth. Oh far. my goodness, all right. Um, well, that was pretty slow progress, <laughs> I was beginning to think. So when an offer came along for me to join the, the 
nascent computer industry, I leaped. Okay. Leapt. leapt. You leapt. You were ready. I was ready. So I went to work for Potter Instrument Company down in Long Island. They were in Great Neck, Long Island at the time. Small company. They had about 80 employees when I joined them. And I think one of the things that impressed me most about Potter was they um, made an arrangement. They, they made an appointment with me to go down and, and uh, see them. So I flew down to LaGuardia Field Commercial. And uh, Jack Potter, the president of the company, met me at the airport. Well, my God, 10 years at the Norton Company, I think I'd spoken to the president once, and that was when I declined their, their uh, pension plan. I figured I could do better just investing myself in the stock market than to put money into their pension plan. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the president said I was the first one that had ever turned down their pension plan and wanted to know what was wrong with me. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, Jack Potter met me at the airport, and I was so impressed with this little company and the the uh, frenzied amount of activity going on. They had lots of projects underway, and they were just getting into the front end of digital magnetic tape recording after having built a career on electronic counters in various combinations. Um, they had started by um, building a photoelectric screen system that used their counter to measure the flight time of projectiles. So, for instance, uh, okay. the uh, armory, oh, I've forgotten the name. Um, there was an armory that was involved with machine guns, and they were measuring the, the uh, speed of the machine gun bullets with this rig. And, and what uh, did it do? How did it work? It used... Well, the bullet would pass through a first photoelectric screen. That would trigger a, a counter. Yes. Not a counter, but a, uh, frequen a frequency time counter. Yes. And so it's driven by an oscillator, say a megahertz oscillator. And they'd measure how many microseconds it is before the bullet passes the second screen. I see. Okay. Once screen number one turns on the counter, screen number two turns it off. And there's okay. your flight time. Very You've good. measured the distance, so there's how fast it's going. Yeah. Aberdeen Proving Ground. So it sold oh, three, yes, of of these, course. three of these setups to Aberdeen Proving Ground. Um, one of their big applications was selling counters to zipper manufacturers. They could run a probe the length of the zipper and tell you exactly how long that, how many segments were in the in the zipper. That was a good market for them. Okay. And so on. But they were. Um, they'd been asked by uh, one of their customers to add a magnetic tape. Uh, recording device to one of their counter systems to record the data automatically rather than having a person writing it down. And the only tape recorder they could find, digital magnetic tape recorder, was made by Raytheon and cost them 12,000 bucks. So Jack Potter took a look at it and said, we can build one a lot less expensive than that. And so they had, uh, when I arrived, they had uh, created a first generation um, tape drive that was in three separate rack mounting panels. So it was an upper reel drive, a capstan drive, and a lower reel drive as three separate elements. Now, had were was magnetic tape being used commercially yeah, this is at half this time? Inch, um, plastic based, mylar based magnetic tape. So do you and know whether year, IBM was using it for digital recording yet? Or? Um, yes, I believe yes, IBM was into it at that point. This was in nineteen fifty five. Ah, okay. But there wasn't much of an independent industry yet. Yes. Um, so um, I arrived at Potter, and um, I didn't actually start working on their tape drives immediately. The first project that I was assigned was um, a, a project to build a random access memory system, which uh, was one of Jack Potter's conceptions. It was a 3D selection scheme that would ultimately select a strip of tape and move it to one of 10 vertical positions and then stroke a recording head along one-tenth of the length of the tape in, that, in the desired location. And um, these strips of tape were mounted 10 strips to a steel frame. And the steel frame was supported in a, uh, a box with a series of slots cut that the frames could slide in. So the selection mechanism on oh, stacked, I think, three uh, frames in this dimension, something like 50 frames in this dimension, 
and then any one of 10 positions vertically. So there's a, f a fair number of recording locations in yeah. this thing. Um, when I uh, got assigned to that project, I found that they really hadn't made very much progress yet. They hadn't figured out how they were going to select and position these frames. So I went to work and designed a, uh, a, 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 a pneumatic positioning system using binary graded cylinders, um, the number required for the particular uh, dimension of movement, and um, used air pressure to uh, move each cylinder to its full stroke in one direction or the other. And the main problem was um, how to control the velocity at which they moved so that it would be a gentle settlement, not a slam bang. So um, I went back to the hydraulic uh, fluid, uh, oil hydraulic stuff that I've been doing at Norton Company, and designed these cylinders with a uh, hydraulic component that um, had a variable porting system that as the piston moved, it would uh, gradually close ports, which are just holes drilled in the side walls of the cylinder to uh, bring it to a smooth stop in that direction. So air is pushing it, but the oil is controlling the velocity. And again, that involved a fair amount of uh, calculation. So I, was, I spent the first few weeks at Potter sitting there turning the crank on the, hand, on the desk calculator, the mechanical desk calculator. And I was told later that uh, the people in that company found that a very impressive performance <laughs> and <laughs> kind of cemented my career with Potter. <laughs> Um, well, this was a real Rube Goldberg of a machine, and uh, while it worked, it didn't work very well, and God knows what the uh, reliability was going to be. So, uh, actually, three of them had been built for UNIVAC and St. Paul, and um, I don't think they ever got into service. They just weren't. It wasn't really a practical solution. They were not reliable. Fundamentally, no. weren't reliable. Yeah. But I'd been at Potter only 12 weeks working on that random access memory project when the sales vice president came to me and said, uh, say, George, uh, wonder if you could tackle another job at the same time you're working on this random access memory. Oh, what's that, Johnny? Johnny Wild was the guy's name. And Johnny told me that um, they had a trade show coming up in another 12 weeks, something about 12 weeks, and that um, the chap who was working on a, a next model of tape drive for them uh, was uh, running pretty slow on it, and he had Johnny had pretty serious reservations about whether they were going to have a product to put into this show. So he was wondering whether I could uh, take over on that and uh, get something out in 12 weeks. Well, sure. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <Why> of course. <laughs> I mean, this is a very different environment from the Norton Company. <laughs> yes, exactly, clearly. So uh, I took the easy way out. I didn't change anything in the electronics of the product, but took these three panels and put all their stuff onto one piece of uh, aluminum jig plate. So it was a one panel machine. And we added to it a um, handle that one could turn that would bring tension arms into a loading position that gave you a linear tape threading path, which the earlier three unit did not have. And we added um, a third roller to the tension arms, whereas the previous ones had two. And um, that combination let us take the tape speed from 60 inches a second up to 75 inches a second and made the thing generally more uh, user-friendly and more in a, a comfortable kind yeah. of design. And um, it took the same amount of, of uh, rack space as the previous machine, but it was a cleaner product. So we got it out in 12 weeks and got it in the trade show, and that became the Potter Model 905 tape handler. Okay. And we sold several thousand of those over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, subsequently, we brought out the Model 906, and I'd have more to say about that a little later. Yeah, okay. But that, uh, that was kind of... Uh, my solo engineering career, as it were. Okay, yeah. In 1957, the, uh, 
Model uh, 905 tape drive was um, coming to the end of its life, and we were needing a replacement for it. And um, just about that time, a, a most fortunate thing happened, and that is that a man named Andrew Gabor, Dr. Andrew Gabor, walked in the door and said, I wonder if you have any jobs for engineers in this company. Well, I interviewed him. I was the uh, manager of the, of the computer peripheral equipment side of the engineering department at that point. Ah, which after involved your... printers as well as uh, tape Oh, all right. So I interviewed Andy, and I uh, was just bowled over with the guy. He was a PhD, had worked in Budapest as a radar uh, development engineer, and um, appeared to know just infinitely more about signal processing than any of the people in our staff did. And so we hired him in an instant. And the first project I gave him was to uh, bring along the next generation of read-write amplifier for our seven-track IBM-compatible tape drives, which he did handily. Yeah, beautiful piece of work. Um, on the Model 906 tape drive that we were trying to generate to replace the 905, uh, one thing we wanted to do was to experiment with the use of silicon-controlled rectifiers for the real drive servo motors. Okay. Now, were you? Was the objective to have lower cost or higher performance or? Well, all of the above. All of the above. And okay. greater reliability. And greater reliability. We had been using Thyrotron, a little 2050, I think it was called Thyrotron, mm -hmm. um, as the uh, control element for the servo motors of the original Potter drive and also of the 905. And uh, we were reading about the remarkable SCR uh, development that was coming along. And we decided that uh, that was just the thing we needed to drive some beefier motors to uh, handle the tape more effectively. And um, my recollection is of asking Andy to take a look at that, and he, he did, and uh, came up with a very successful drive. We are using a one-horsepower DC motor and um, four SCRs in an H configuration to uh, give a bi-directional uh, control for the motors. Now, at the time we started this project, the SCRs were being priced at uh, something like $2,000 each. And uh, we're going to put eight of them in each of our drives. Um, target price for the drive, OEM sales price was $3,500. So <laughs> you, were <laughs> you could either say we were nuts or that we had the courage of our convictions. Yes. But fortunately, by the time we um, actually got the machine into production, which wasn't all that much later, the price had come down to a few bucks per SCR. And of course, once they got into washing machines and so forth, they were down to 95 cents a piece. So that was a, a really good decision. And Andy did a beautiful job of uh, putting together a, a circuit that would drive those motors very effectively. Um, another project that uh, Andy took on was uh, we were trying to get, of course, uh, higher and higher recording densities. Um, at that time, the standard in the industry was the IBM uh, seven-channel non-return to zero recording at a density of, uh, if I recall correctly, 256 bits per inch. And uh, Andy, by this time, was pretty familiar with the behavior of magnetic tape systems, uh, going back to his signal processing background and radar work in, in uh, Hungary. So he uh, came to us and said, you know, I think we can uh, get at least four times more uh, density on these tapes than we're getting, and uh, without any sacrifice in reliability. So, of course, that became what we wanted to do. Yes, of course. <laughs> and uh, the way he approached it was to, um, first of all, 
he uh, chose to use a one inch wide tape instead of a half inch tape, so we're departing from IBM compatibility. But he used uh, paired tracks so that there'd be paired tracks spaced a half an inch apart. And combining the signals from the two uh, gave him uh, protection from tape defects. That was a major okay. um, step in recording reliability. Well, the net result of, of uh, his work, on, uh, the problem, of course, was de-skewing across a one-inch wide tape. Right. But um, he handled those problems very effectively, and I'm sorry to say that I can't tell you how. That is the details of how he yeah. accomplished it in terms of the circuitry. But he did. And in fact, we um, found a, um, uh, an interested buyer in the form of uh, Dave Evans, then the chief engineer of Bendix, Bendix Computer. Okay. Um, Dave had been using our earlier tape drives on the G15. And um, when the G20 came along, he wanted a higher density recording system, and Andy's system fit in nicely. So Bendix became our customer for the uh, Potter 1100 bit per inch high density system. And um, I don't remember how many G20s were built, but I know one of the first one went to uh, Dr. Perlis, is it? At, oh, yeah, uh, Alan Perlis. Alan Perlis at Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Mellon. And um, worked out very satisfactorily. So that was a, a triumph for Potter. All right, yes. It took some time before IBM got up to that density, but of course, since then, they've gone on to incredibly higher densities that were, yeah. were unbelievable at the time. That's interesting. So there was a, there was a significant market for something that was really high density, yeah. and the IBM compatibility was not yet just that's right. something you absolutely had to do. Although, you know, it's possible that uh, lack of IBM compatibility on the tapes may have uh, crimped the commercial success of the G20. The G20 did not become a dominant machine in the industry. Right. Mm -hmm. And that may have been part of it. Who knows? Um, one other project that um, Andy worked on at Potter was... Um, providing the circuitry for a um, um, coordinate inspection machine. Um, Ferranti in England had produced a uh, machine for use in uh, inspection departments of uh, companies building mechanical products, uh, even including circuit boards and things like that, that um, consisted of, uh, first of all, it was a large table like three or four feet wide and two or three feet deep. And there was a kind of gantry crane with a, a descending probe. And um, you could move this thing around in three dimensions. You had both the uh, width and the, and the uh, front to back, and also a vertical movement of the probe. And a uh, uh, Nixie tube readout of what the dimension is what the coordinates, what the coordinates of where of you the are. the point where it's sitting. Okay. And Potter decided, gee, here's a perfect application for my counters. I, we've been in this counter technology right along, and we, we need something to uh, further that. So Andy worked on the circuitry to uh, drive the counters in such a mechanical system. And uh, we're using uh, photoelectric scales, that is the position sensing element was a, uh, a linear uh, photographically produced scale with a reticle that would ride on it and a photoelectric cell looking at what's happening. In fact, two photocells with, a, uh, with a, a, a dual pattern so that you had uh, two signals offset by 90 degrees that you could uh, tell which direction you were moving in. And, uh, uh, Andy developed all that circuitry. The reason I mention that is that uh, this business of uh, um, using, uh, well, let's go back to a simpler, uh, uh, f easier for me to describe situation at least. Back when I was at Norton Company, one of the things that I worked on was uh, what I called an electronic micrometer. And um, 
the way this one worked was that uh, I had a, a round uh, rod in which I cut threads so it looked like a, a bolt or a threaded rod and um, put windings wound a wire, two wires uh, in adjacent V's of the thread. So I had a bifiler winding running the length of this rod. Mm -hmm. And then a, uh, a, a thin cylinder surrounding the rod with a single winding on it of the same pitch. And by exciting the, the bifiler windings with two AC signals 90 degrees out of phase, um, we'd had a situation where the pickup on the um, moving coil would reflect its position in a phase determined manner. That is the phase of the signal coming out of the pickup would uh, uh, vary from in phase to 90 degrees out to 180 degrees out and so forth as it moved along uh, one pitch of the screw. And um, that principle, um, the principle of a bifiler winding came into play in uh, Andy's subsequent work. Uh, in a sense, it was in play in this coordinate measuring machine because the photoelectric grating was providing two degrees, two signals, two photoelectric signals, 90 degrees out of phase, and you could tell which direction it was moving in by how those signals varied, the two pickoffs. Yeah. Um, in the thing that I did at Norton Company, I wasn't concerned because I had a, uh, a uh, rotary electronic device, a, a rotary uh, uh, rotating electrical machine, a, a synchro device uh, driven from the signal. So it simply followed what was happening on the pickoff. Okay. So I only needed a single pickoff. Okay. But um, it stayed phase locked. But in this other type of situation, you're counting what's happening. And you have null crossings. And the null crossings are the critical point. But then you want to know You want to know uh, which you want to interpolate coming. between the null yeah. crossings. Well in some um, sense. Um, yes and no. Anyway, um, in, the, in the subsequent application, it's a non-interpolation thing, but there's another trick that came into play that I see. is important. All right. In uh, 1964, um, I received an offer to uh, join the Frieden Calculator Division of Singer in uh, San Leandro, California. Singer had acquired Frieden the previous October. Now and Frieden was just making the calculators at Frieden had been started in 1935 by Carl Frieden, who had been the chief engineer at Marchant Calculators. Okay. <laughs> yes. So he, he split off, <laughs> spun right. off, Spin-offs aren't new. <laughs> right. He spun off from Marchant to found his own company, Frieden uh, Calculators, and became probably the leading company. There were th really three in it, Monroe, Marchant, and Frieden. And um, by uh, the 60s, the uh, uh, mechanical calculators were under severe pressure from uh, what was beginning to be the computer industry. And uh, there was uh, work being done in various places on electronic calculators. And in fact, um, Frieden hired a couple of guys out of Burroughs, um, L.P. Robinson and George Hare, to uh, come in and uh, get an electronic calculator program moving at Frieden. Their challenge was how to lift Frieden out of the mechanical age into the electronic age. And um, so I was one of the people that they hired to help in that process. So I, I joined them in uh, May of uh, 1964 as director of R&D for the San Leandro lab. The company had four laboratories. They had a facility in Rochester, New York, which is the former Commercial Controls Corporation, 
that had been acquired by Frieden. Commercial Controls built the Flexor Rider. Ah, now the Flexor yes. Rider had originated as an IBM product, and uh, used using uh, paper tape for input output. Mm -hmm. It uh, incurred the displeasure of of uh, Watson Senior, and so they had uh, spun off their Flexor Rider activity from IBM to the managers, who set up Commercial Controls Corporation to carry on the Flexor Rider work, and. Uh, Frieden had subsequently acquired commercial controls sometime in the 50s, I guess. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, one of the um, children of that marriage was a line of products called CompuTypers, which were a combination of the Frieden mechanical calculator as an arithmetic unit and the Flexor Writer as the I.O. and printing device. And the CompuTypers uh, were used for uh, simple billing accounting applications in small businesses. In a sense, they were competing with the bottom end of the Burroughs line of accounting products. Yes. But it was a successful product line. They were selling several thousand CompuTypers a year. Mm -hmm. the, it, was a really, it was really a kludge. I mean, the calculator portion of it was rigged up with solenoids to punch the buttons and with uh, rotary contact making pickoffs to read the contents of the accumulator out to relays. <laughs> oh my <laughs> goodness, it? that is a kludge. <laughs> yeah. And the flexor writer, of course, uh, used uh, solenoids to actuate the, the um, key driving elements. Many of the very earliest mini computers mm -hmm. used flexor writers as their the I.O. until the ASR, uh, until... Yeah. Uh, it was Teletype the came standard out with of the, the ASR thirty three. For some time. Yes. Um, so I joined Frieden in sixty four uh, with the charge of helping them continue this process of moving into the electronic world. At the time I arrived, they'd already taken a giant step in that direction. In that they had just started marketing the Frieden Model uh, one thirty electronic calculator which was the first U.S. Uh, designed and manufactured uh, machine of its type. Uh, there was one in England that preceded it by a few months, but uh, we were the first in this country. That was an interesting product. It used a um, coiled piano wire uh, coil as a delay line memory for storing uh, 1,024 uh, digits. An this is an acoustic, an acoustic delay, delay, delay line. line. Yeah. Oh wow! Acoustic All right. Delay line. Um, and it had a, um, a CRT screen display that put up, as I recall, five lines of stuff. There was, f there were four registers in the machine. They displayed the contents of the four registers plus uh, the uh, what? Do, what do you call the active? Uh, memory element where work's being done. Oh, the accumulator, probably. The accumulator. Yeah. So um, they were selling these for roughly $2,000 a copy, as opposed to something in the range of seven or 800 up to $1,100 a copy for their mechanical calculators. Oh, the pride of the Frieden line in the mechanical calculators was their machine that would do square roots. That was sort of the epitome of of mechanical engineering and yes. ingenuity, yes. That's right. Okay. Six to eight thousand parts and a manufacturing cost that averaged about five cents a part. So they could they could do a six thousand part calculator for a three hundred dollar manufacturing cost. <laughs> wow. One of the more interesting uh, job titles in that company was um, tweaker. Well, you might ask, what is a tweaker? A tweaker is a person who has great skill in manipulating a screwdriver that has a slot cut in the tip of the screwdriver. And this slot could be um, slid down over some mechanical linkage part and given a tweak to change its length minutely. And uh, these folks stood at the end of the production line and they'd run tests on the calculator and if it's not doing quite right, they'd know exactly which part to tweak to make it run correctly. And that's the way the machine got shipped. Oh my goodness. 
<laughs> I'm not quite sure what the electronic equivalent of that is. Exactly. But uh, maybe potentiometers come close. Yes, I think they come very close. Little potentiometers with a slot in the head and the right. end and of the shaft and a small screwdriver. Just line it up. drop in that shaft and you could twiddle something. Right. Um, there weren't any bullseye patterns on an oscilloscope to help these uh, mechanical calculator tweakers, mm -hmm. but uh, they developed great proficiency in the art. Okay. Well, that's a great story. So, um, one of the uh, projects that was underway when I joined the company was the development of the first electronic computyper, in which the arithmetic unit from this 130 calculator, along with its delay line, was used as the uh, central processor. They used a second delay line for fast memory uh, storage. Mm -hmm. And um, it drove a flexor writer. And the flexor writer paper tape punch reader was the I.O. So it was a complete little electronic computer that uh, uh, was selling, for, uh, well, it, it was under design when I arrived. And, uh, you know, my recollection is that um, we made a decision early on to change the uh, design of the PC boards from a transistorized version, which is what was active when I got there, to using the hex inverters that had just come on the market. Ah, you remember the... Yes. The, uh, for one of the first integrated circuits, uh, Caterpillar-like thing, was the hex inverter, mm -hmm. and uh, we used the hex inverter for the main logic element to build the 5610 computypers. Okay. Now, was the this program was this did this have a stored program? Oh or? yeah, it was a plugboard program. Okay. Yep. Had a plugboard program. Okay. Yep. Um, so an outgrowth of that work was a more ambitious project um, that got. We got started um, a year or two after I joined the company to build a uh, multi-user computyper. It, uh, in fact, uh, turned out to be uh, one of the early mini computers for business application. And this was being developed in the time frame around 1967 or so. Okay. It um, was intended to um, support up to 20 operators sitting at their own individual flexor riders. And uh, I remember one of the big issues in designing it was do we use a 6-bit character or do we use an 8-bit character? Memory being expensive in those days. Yes. And this was going to semiconductor memory rather than delay line memory. So uh, the decision was made in favor of 6-bit uh, organization to keep it... Keep the cost keep down. It cost, keep it economical. And in fact, uh, uh, we did uh, succeed in making a product out of this, and it went to market in 1969. And um, uh, the big, the big uh, problem was uh, supporting, the, supporting it with software. Of course, nobody else was providing software for this machine, so Frieden had to develop its own accounting software and all the application ah, yes. stuff, okay. uh -huh. and operating system, and so forth. Oh, one other uh, detail of the, this ultimately was sold as the Singer System 10, a uh, multi-user, multitasking uh, office mini computer, Singer System 10. All right, with a store, not a plug board program. This had an internal. That's right. Internally, internally stored. Board. Yep. Um, program. One of the amusing uh, details of its design was that a certain amount of memory could be allocated to each user terminal and it was allocated with a hardware jumper that was soldered in place. So whenever somebody wanted to change the configuration of his office, the Frieden technician would have to come out and uh, re-solder new jumpers in to uh, affect the proper memory allocations to the various user stations. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I believe that Singer and Frieden Singer uh, succeeded in selling some substantial number of these in the U.S., perhaps approaching a thousand. Um, but in the dissolution of Frieden, which took place in the, in the mid-70s, uh, this 
product line of the Singer System 10 was sold off to uh, international computers and tabulators, ICT was yes, it? In, in England. England. And what I've heard is that they uh, sold another 1,500 of them before the product was declared obsolete. My goodness. So a fair number of those got distributed around the world. Well, not a fair number in comparison with the number of computers today, but for yes, the time, for it, really, time. it was a respectable thing. One of the uh, needs for that machine was for uh, mass storage. And um, the project engineer on it, who was an ex-Burroughs man, was all uh, excited about buying a um, horizontal spindle fixed disk drive from uh, control data to provide mass storage. And um, Horizontal spindle. Beg pardon? Horizontal spindle, yeah. yes. With so a the disc, is... disc on each end of it. Oh my um, goodness. Made by uh, control data. Okay. A very expensive thing, I might add. Mm -hmm. Well, it was at about this time that I had a phone call from Andy Gabor saying that uh, he was interested in uh, finding out whether we had any work for him. Oh. He had been working at Honeywell for about three years, yes. left Potter shortly after I did, and joined Honeywell in, uh, what's the town in, it's, it's not Braintree, but. No, he worked, I believe, in Waltham. Waltham, okay. Yes, that's where I first met him. That's the, where you met him? That's where I met him, because okay. I was at a. Well, he was working on uh, disk drive developments, uh, I believe, under Mario Chu, was it? Yeah. Um, Xuan Chu. Xuan Chu, that's. Xuan Chu, okay. yes. And uh, I guess he uh, felt uncomfortable in that environment for reasons that I don't fully understand. It was an extremely political environment. Okay, that would rub Andy the wrong way. Yes. <laughs> Andy is the kind of person who has in just incredible powers of concentration. When he's given a task, he just devotes himself single mindedly to it. Uh, one of the consequences is that uh, uh, you simply cannot persuade him to work on two projects at once. It's just not done. Mm -hmm. But he will apply himself so diligently to that one project that he produces an absolutely superb result every time. And uh, I guess the political thing you're talking probably was yanking him around so much at Honeywell that he couldn't stand it. Mm -hmm. So, sure. Uh, I thought, here is a perfect opportunity for us to get a disk drive. <laughs> yeah. He's had some disk drive experience at Honeywell. And Andy, could you design us something along the lines of the uh, 2311 uh, disk drive from the IBM line using the 6 high disk pack? Sure. So he joined us in 67, uh, I believe it was, and went to work on building his uh, 2311 clone. Uh, he took a rather different direction in that work from the uh, IBM design concept. IBM used a hydraulic positioner, and uh, uh, the machine was, uh, the 2311 was famous for dribbling oil all over the floor. In fact, uh, when the insurance companies installed acres of these things, they were careful to put an oil pan under each, an oil catch pan under each. He's just drive. <laughs> um, so Andy joined us at Frieden and uh, set to work designing an all-electronic um, equivalent of a 2311. Really, the only things that were uh, IBM related in it were the heads, the recording heads, and the disk pack. And everything else was unique. So you were going to use uh, their, their, rec their disk pack? Yes. And their recording heads, or? Well, no. By then, there was an independent industry. Ah, so you could just up. buy them, yeah. Uh, Juggy Tandon, for example, was starting to produce uh, IBM mm -hmm. disc heads, flying heads. <clears throat> well, Andy designed a disk drive in which he um, used a um, DC motor for positioning the heads. The shaft of the motor was elongated. Here's the motor, and the shaft sticks out. And um, a, a, a pinion gear is uh, ground in the end of that shaft. Uh, oh, it's, you know, half an inch long pinion. 
And um, the head carriage has a mating rack that engages this pinion under a light spring pressure. It's uh, heavy enough spring pressure so that the uh, torque of the motor won't cause it to skip teeth, but it's a light enough pressure so that it doesn't wear. And by having this spring engagement, it's a zero backlash construction. So that by placing a position transducer on the other end of the shaft of the positioning motor, he can measure angular position, which translates through the rack and pinion to linear position of the head, and in that way locate the tracks. Now the transducer that he used for the positioning was one of these bifiler type devices. It was actually a printed circuit card, a couple inches in diameter, that had a pattern of U-shaped conductors with one complete cycle of that U-shaped pattern for each track on the disc. And a second set of these U-shaped things interleaved with the first set to form a bifiler winding. And then a, a pickoff that is uh, scanning this thing and um, observing, um, well, the, the two bi the bifiler windings are excited from the oscillator at some reasonable frequency. I, f I don't remember what frequency used. It may have been above the audio range, but I'm not sure. Uh, it must have been because I'd, I never heard any, any squealing sounds, yeah. coming out. <laughs> I did, uh, and I wasn't old enough at that point to uh, blame that on my ears. So um, with this pickoff system, he had a zero crossing uh, of a particular polarity at each track location. And he uh, servoed on that zero crossing to put the track, put the heads at the right location to center them over the track. Now, the signal that he's actually working with is a sinusoidal signal that's coming out of the transducer. So he can go from track to track by counting zero crossings. He uses a counter to do that. But when he is on the portion of the track right near the zero, he's got kind of a linear position signal. And he can use that in his servo to home in on the, on the precise location. Now the problem is that the servo system that does that is unstable if all you're giving it is position information. It'll just go into wild oscillation. In the uh, Frieden design, he added a th another element to the bottom of this servo motor shaft in the form of a DC tack generator, a little DC motor, an inch and a half, two inches tall, which generated a DC voltage proportional to the speed at which it's rotating. And that gets fed back into the servo as a stabilizing element in the servo amplifier design and lets the thing come right in on zero without any, without, you know. It, <laughs> uh, it stabilizes the system. And without it, it'll just oscillate wildly. So this resulted in a uh, mechanism that did not dribble oil on the floor. The height of the whole structure was maybe eight inches or so, 10 inches maybe. Uh, at Frieden, we mounted it in a cabinet that looked just like the IBM cabinet. It was a floor-standing cabinet and brought the working platform, the turntable as it were, it's not really a turntable, but brought the cone of engagement up to a, a waist height and so operators would feel perfectly comfortable. It's something they're familiar with. But it was all empty space down below instead of hydraulic pumps and tubing and so forth. <laughs> Um, the other thing is that in the uh, IBM positioning system with the hydraulic actuator, um, to ensure uh, that the heads are located properly on the tracks, they had a kind of a rack-like device and a spring, uh, a spring detent that would detent it to force the final position to be accurate. Andy's design did not require a detent the precision of this zero crossing from the transducer and the stability of his servo drive was such that he could just home right in 
That's the track, and the electronics holds it in position. No detenting. Okay. No so mechanical detent. Net result, uh, a reliability that's infinitely ahead of the mechanical reliability of the IBM machine. Mm -hmm. So Andy designed this um, disk drive over a period of a year and a half or so. And uh, I recall well, in January 1969, we had a staff meeting with the new president of Frieden who had been sent in by Singer, reviewing all of the R&D projects and which ones should we keep and which ones should we drop for economy reasons. And uh, the guy who was the systems architect for this System 10 computer that we were developing uh, made a, uh, an impassioned plea that we should drop this disk drive project because it was an unproven technology. Uh, nobody could be sure it was going to work. It was going to be very expensive to build something like that. The manufacturing VP piped up that, uh, gosh, we've never built anything with that kind of precision in this shop. Uh, our parts tweakers won't know what to do with it. Uh, I'm not sure we can build a damn thing. Uh, so I went around the circle of about 10 managers, and I was the only one that was sticking up for that project. So uh, the president, Bob Campbell, who had come from Link Aviation, another Singer acquisition, um, said, well, we're going to drop that project. Well, I was really heartbroken. It just didn't make any sense at all. So that night I went over to Andy's house. My wife and I went over and sat down with Andy and his wife and said, don't you think we can do better on our own? <laughs> And he said, you know, every, everywhere I go, uh, large corporations are awful. Okay. He had yeah. the Honeywell situation. Prior to that, that he had political issues at uh, Potter. Mm -hmm. Now here at, at uh, Frieden, yeah. he's back in the same kind of morass. Yeah. So he said, uh, if you can find a way of guaranteeing me a salary for a couple of years, I'll go with you. <laughs> so that's that's what it took. And that's yeah, that's what it took. So we decided at that point we'd uh, write a business plan and go looking for money, so on and so forth. Um, we still weren't willing to abandon the project at Frieden. Okay. And um, Andy completed the machine. It was just about finished at the time of that meeting. His yeah. his. Uh, Engineering. Prototype. Yeah, engineering prototype. Yeah, it was a little more than a prototype. It was really, a, it was not quite a beta machine, but it was well, well beyond an alpha machine. Okay. And we'd hooked it up to Frieden's IBM 360, and it had worked perfectly. And the accounting guys were saying, boy, that's pretty nice. It's quiet. It doesn't drip oil on the floor. <laughs> so that gave me an idea. I called Harvey Goodman. Harvey was the highly publicized president of a computer of a company called Data Processing Financial in General, DPF&G, okay. based in New York, that was one of the early uh, companies in the computer leasing business. And he had hundreds of IBM computers scattered around the world with people asking him for more disk drives, which he had to buy from IBM. So we got, I told Harvey about this project and this product and uh, asked him to come out and talk with us. So he said, I, I will do that. He came out, and um, Andy spent a morning with him uh, demonstrating how this alpha beta model was working on the 360. And uh, then in the afternoon, we go in to meet with this president, Bob Campbell. Well, this, by now, we're up into uh, late February or so of that year. And um, Bob Campbell says, well, I understand uh, that you've seen, seen the disk drive product. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing your opinion of it. And Harvey drew himself up and he said, that's the best goddamn engineering project I've ever seen in my life. And I was responsible for keeping an eye on all the engineering projects at IBM for X number of years. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, yes. <laughs> all right. Campbell sits up. Well, <laughs> well, well, what have we uh, done here? Uh, is this a product that would be uh, of interest to people like you in the computer leasing business? You're damn right it is. Well, uh, 
would you be interested in buying some of these? He said, I'll give you an order for a thousand of them right now. How soon can you supply? <laughs> oh my goodness. I hadn't prompted this guy at all. I mean, yeah. he was just very enthusiastic about what he had seen. Yeah. And he didn't have any hesitation about And he had enough of a technical felt. background to understand he, yeah, how, exactly. how clever yeah. what he'd seen was. That's right. And how it worked That's and right. how ingenious it was. So that, uh, it that was. shook Bob Campbell loose a little bit. And Bob called in a senior technical advisor, a guy named Dr. John Hunt who had uh, been on the staff at uh, Link Aviation with him, whom he really trusted. And John came in and took a look at it, same sort of thing as Harvey, Harvey's look, and uh, his report to Campbell was just the same as Harvey's. Fantastic that this project went so well, that the result is so good, blah, blah, blah. So the net result of all that was that uh, Campbell decided, well, we'll rescind the cancellation and we'll complete this project. And Andy uh, figured he needed until June to get it all wrapped up, get the loose ends tied tied up. And um, meanwhile, we, we were working on a business plan. You still hadn't, you hadn't given up your well, idea. Well, at that point, I leveled with Campbell and said, look, um, uh, we'll stay here long enough to finish this product and uh, make sure that it's in good shape. But uh, Andy and I are looking for money to start a company. Okay, fine. So we had an amicable sort of okay. agreement on that. We're both staying on the payroll and so on. So then we started looking for money. Now our first, our first um, business plan contemplated building a um, small, a thin version of this yeah. disk drive. Mm -hmm. And whereas the mechanism in the Frieden drive was yay big, yay tall, Andy felt that... Um, Given the linear nature of this signal from his transducer around the zero crossing, that uh, if he could differentiate that signal and develop a velocity term that way for his servo, that he could dispense with the tack generator. And that would shrink our height a couple of inches. So we wrote a business plan around this concept of a disk drive. And um, we could see the mini computers coming along and so we slanted it toward the single cartridge idea, single platter cartridge, okay. um, just by way of illustration. Well, that's not the best picture. Here's a pretty good picture of it. This was a, this was a uh, product flyer put out by our Japanese uh, licensee. Okay. And it shows the IBM 2310 cartridge. cartridge. Yeah, 2310 cartridge okay. that uh, IBM used in their 2315 single cartridge disk drive that was incorporated in such products as the 1130 computer. Yeah. Okay. And that was the cartridge we decided to use and was incorporated in this business plan. And this is, in fact, the Diablo disk drive that was the outcome of this effort. It's six and a half inches tall, as compared to the, well. <laughs> oh, yeah, here's, here's a picture. Here's the Diablo disk drive mm -hmm. sitting in a uh, cabinet that was designed by Mohawk Data Science as one of our customers. Yeah. And they wanted a cabinet that would resemble IBM. So they've got this really quite compact disk drive sitting at the top end of a very empty box. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. By the way, there are several of these scattered around the um, uh, Computer History Museum Good. collection. All right. So let's see, where were we? Uh, so we put together the business plan and started carrying it around to the venture capital community. Now and this must be when, 1970? No, this is um, spring of 69. Spring of, we're still in 69. Yeah, okay, spring yeah. of 69. And we got nothing but ho-hum response to it. Uh, they, just, they just didn't see the commercial potential and uh, uh, why all this hullabaloo, this, you know, uh, big disc packs and things in the future, lots of storage capacity. 
Um, Even though you could clearly show that this was going to have a much lower cost so, than anything um, IBM was building. The final shot at that stage of the business plan was a trip to the East Coast to visit with a company in Connecticut called Electronic Capital Corporation. And we spent uh, a Saturday morning with their chief honchos. And all they could talk about was the uh, mobile home company they had just acquired down in South Carolina. <laughs> and they weren't the least bit interested in hearing our disk drive story. <laughs> so on the flight back home, uh, Andy and I looked at each other and said, this just isn't going to fly, is it? And it was at that point that I offered what I think was a very valuable suggestion. I said, you know, Andy, if you could use these positioning techniques that you have perfected for the head positioning, and especially this new idea of yours of uh, developing the velocity term without another piece of hardware hung on the drive motor, then uh, you might be able to build a printer this way. If you could use that technique to position a daisy wheel printing element, as opposed to an IBM golf ball, which has two coordinates of motion, you choose a daisy wheel with only one coordinate of motion, and also use the same technique for positioning the carriage, the print carriage, that carries it. Uh, we might have a really good product. Well, he said, that sounds interesting. Uh, how fast would it have to go to be saleable? I said, well, the competition would be the IBM Selectric typewriter. And they advertised the Selectric as running at 15 characters a second. Of course, it really doesn't run at 15 characters a second because every time they do a shift operation, that steals a cycle. And uh, if they were doing all shift operations, it would run at seven and a half characters a second. So its true average speed is somewhere between seven and a half and 15, depending on the application. I was very conscious of this, conscious of this because by then I'd become the vice president of engineering for all of Frieden, and I had responsibility for the lab in. Uh, Rochester as well. Ah, okay. And uh, deeply embedded in Flexorider stuff. Oh, okay. Um, and Flexorider was, was on How do we make the Flexorider run at 12 characters a second? <laughs> yes. It had been running at 10 characters a second since For it ages. was designed. Yes, okay. And uh, if we can only get it up to 12 characters a second, maybe we can compete with this IBM Selectric thing. So I said to Andy, you know, if we could run a daisy wheel printer at 30 characters a second, twice the advertised figure of the IBM Selectric, we would have a, a world beater. So I said, well, let me think about it. Now, I know when Andy's thinking, you don't talk to him. So he sat with the back of an envelope and a pencil and a calculator for about a half an hour. Then he turned to me and said, I think we could do it. Okay. <laughs> so. Generation two of the business plan adds a daisy wheel printer okay. running at 30 characters a second, twice the IBM advertised speed. And we decided that uh, even that might not be enough. I mean, we'd seen how hard shelled these VCs were. So we said um, uh, the printer and the disk drive by themselves are going to be OEM products. And uh, maybe the VCs are afraid of companies that have to rely on other companies to sell their product. So perhaps we should put an end user product into the kit at the same time. So we've got the waterfront covered. So we added a third product, namely a word processor that would incorporate our mass memory device and our printing device. So we'd be building most of the guts of this word processor, get ourselves into the end user business. Okay. Word processors. Uh, were kind of uh, interesting to people in those days because the IBM magnetic tape, uh, they called it the IBM magnetic tape selectric typewriter, mm -hmm. was doing very well. And okay. Other people were trying to get in and figure out what they could do to take advantage of that same market opportunity. Yeah. So we redid our business plan that way, and um, within a few weeks we had found a backer which meant that... Um, Who did that turn out to be? That was uh, ITEL Corporation. They were a group in San Francisco that started with um, the former San Francisco IBM branch manager, a guy named Gary Friedman, 
and his sidekick, his buddy, Pete Redfield, who had been a uh, uh, manager, vice president for IT for large companies, and they had teamed up to set up a computer leasing firm to compete with his fellow Harvey Goodman. They called it ITEL Corporation. And by the time uh, we started working with them, they had branched out and they were beginning to lease shipping containers, which turned out to be quite a business. Okay. And in fact, that was a highly computerized business in that the, the fundamental strategy of the business appeared to depend on deciding which jobs to turn down. You don't want to send a shipping container off to some place where it's going to sit with no return load for months at a time, burning up your capital. Okay. So they had computerized this whole operation in such a way that they had tighter control of what goes where and when you say no on a possible sale. All right. Okay. <laughs> Very bright guys. Mm -hmm. They subsequently got in trouble, but that's not an uncommon story. So they, uh, they were interested. They are doing all this computer leasing. They were interested in having a hardware capability for their conglomerate. So they decided to finance... Diablo. The financing was arranged through a Palo Alto venture capital firm, Sutter Hill. Oh, yeah. Well, um, that, that got us started. Okay, uh, I want to go back to Frieden a bit. Yes. Um, we had, when I arrived, they had this um, uh, secure lab. It was electromagnetically shielded and the whole bit. And uh, was doing classified work at the highest level for NSA. Mm -hmm. Well, revolving around flexor riders and uh, calculators and so on and so forth. Well, uh, we got an invitation. No, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. In uh, 1966 or so, we had a visit from Fred P. Wilcox, who lived in New Canaan, Connecticut. Fred had been a vice president of uh, Fairchild Camera and Instrument, mm -hmm. stationed back east. I don't think he had anything to do with the semiconductor yeah. work. But he was, um, he was an inventor. Uh, I visited him at his home um, at one point in our interactions. And he had, a, he had a, a home that had been built as a model home by one of the glass companies and had been designed by a famous architect, Philip Johnson or somebody. Oh. Uh, or Ed, Edward Stone, maybe. Anyway, it was um, quite a quite a fabulous, very modern house on spacious grounds in New Canaan. And out back, he's got a machine shop, a complete model shop. Every tool you could imagine. Milling machines, grinders, uh, lathes, so on. And out there, he f personally fabricates each part for each thing he makes. I asked him, well, do you have a machinist that works with you? No, I it's too much trouble to tell them what I want, and they never get it right anyway. So he makes everything. <laughs> so he does himself. it himself. Yep. Okay. He had built a daisy wheel printer that uh, printed on a 40 column wide format. And uh, he was trying to interest the Los Angeles Police Department in putting this into their police cars so that the officers would have a written communication to work with instead of what they thought they heard on the radio to reduce errors, improve efficiency, blah, blah, blah. But uh, things were going slowly down there, and he's wondering whether he could get uh, some company like Frieden, that obviously had need for printers and printing calculators and the like. Um, in fact, one of the neat printers we developed was for the electronic printing calculator version of our electronic calculator. Okay. We did a... Uh, uh, a, a disk printer. It had a character disk in which the characters were displayed around the periphery of this disk, but but in a spiral for a helical format, offset one column width between the beginning and the end of the okay. of the disk. And this disk was caused to translate across the face of the printing uh, document. Uh, in synchronism with its rotation, so that each rotation would have every character appearing in that column position. At the same position, and then when it, it shifted, it's over one. Yeah, but you see, the wheel was moving continuously. Exactly. In both dimensions, yes. this continuous movement 
but the characters were steady here and then jump to steady here and then jump to steady. I very thought it was kind clever. of a neat concept. That's very clever. Uh, so we built that into our printing calculator. And then uh, I got the guys in uh, Holland to make a uh, full character printer out of it with 96 characters around the, the rim of that thing. Okay. And they successfully did that to use as an output for a modern computer. Well, that's another whole story. Okay. But uh, Fred P. Wilcox brought his uh, Daisy Will printer in to show us. He had a model of it. He had used a jeweler's um, saw to carve out each spoke of this... Uh, of a wheel. wheel. Yeah, uh, yeah, he had yeah. a disc yeah. of metal, and then a jeweler's saw, and yeah. he carved it out. Yeah. And in this case, of course, the characters are are not on the edge. They're... they're, they're Positioned up at the end, it's like a daisy wheel. It's just like it's just like this. He made a metal daisy wheel. He okay. carved it in aluminum, yeah. and I've forgotten how he put the characters on the end. But he, he got the characters on the ends of each book, and um, had this thing as a as a demonstration device. Well, he explained the principle to us. Um, this thing works um, by spinning the wheel continuously and translating it. Uh, translating it piecewise from column to column. Okay. So to go to a column and sit there, and it's spinning. Yep. And as the desired character comes into printing position, the hammer makes an impression of that character. And the thing moves on to the next From column. the back, from the rear? Yeah, the hammer is in the back. Yep. There's a ribbon and then the paper. And, and so that's how he prints it. And um, because the character is out on the end of this spoke, and because in a uh, printing device of this kind, the contact time of the, uh, of the character against the platen, which is when the printed image is being formed, yeah. is only something like 50 microseconds or so. If you calculate how much the, the spring that supports that character is going to deflect due to the rotation of the hub during those 50 microseconds, it's small enough so there's very little stress in the spoke. Okay. That's the underlying theory of, of uh, his printer. So uh, we were thinking, boy, this thing really has some potential. Yeah, so there's no it. smear. It just deflects a little bit yeah. for the time it's physically in contact. Yeah, that's right. And it doesn't have the, enough, the it has enough bending The character that it remains in smear. contact yeah. without smearing. Right. And it has so one of the advantages of the um, IBM chain printer. Remember before the chain printer, uh, it was all drum printers, like yeah, the Analex the printer. Yes. And the galloping G's, for example, were a problem. Uh, uh, the characters would move up and down all over the place, depending on what pattern was being printed. So uh, he he overcomes that in the same way that the chain printer does. The motion is this way, so if there's a little bit of smearing, it doesn't produce wiggles up and down that your eye is very sensitive to, but it may produce a little bit of horizontal dither or smearing that you're much less sensitive to. And this daisy wheel printer would do that same thing, but with okay. a lot less smearing than you would have from a rigid print medium, or a print bearing, character bearing medium. So we got quite excited about it and um, offered Fred a uh, licensing deal where we'd pay him a substantial amount of money, in the hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a, a prepaid royalty, and then royalties subsequent to that on the flow of product. Well, um, he uh, said he'd give that careful consideration. And uh, when we heard back from him, he said, well, sorry, but he'd sold it to IBM. That IBM uh, seemed very interested in it. And IBM obviously had more resources than Frieden did. So he decided to sell his patents to IBM. So that was a big disappointment to us. Uh, it was a year or two after that that the U.S. Army Signal Corps in Fort Monmouth, is it? Mm -hmm. uh, came out with a bid request for a forward area teletype system that would comprise a, uh, a keyboard, uh, paper tape input output, uh, and a printing device. Uh, that could be deployed in forward areas. 
and their aim was uh, to minimize electromagnetic radiation that could be picked up for code uh, right. snooping, and um, that they wanted very high reliability. They wanted minimum number of moving parts and so forth. Um, they'd been using uh, teletypes, and they just weren't satisfactory. Um, so we, we decided to bid on it. And our competitor in the bidding was Kleinschmidt. Now, Kleinschmidt was bidding a uh, drum printer with a single hammer that would traverse the length of the drum and pick off the characters uh, in each column position. And we proposed our, uh, we proposed, uh, or we were planning to propose a Daisy Will printer a la Fred Wilcox. So I called Fred. And I said, uh, what do you suppose IBM's reaction would be if uh, we were to inquire with them about bidding this, your printer principal in this signal core job? Hey, that would be terrific, he said. And I don't care a hoot about IBM. You know what they've done? Those bastards have put my invention up on the shelf because they don't want it competing with the Selectric typewriter. So they're not doing a thing with it. I can't even get in the front door of their plant down in South Carolina where they do this work. He was mad as hell at IBM. So they bought it too? They, they bought, they bought his, it to mothball it. They bought, that's it. They, they bought, bought it, it to, to get it off the market. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. and Fred was mad as cops. He said, I don't think IBM would give you the slightest trouble. Is IBM gonna be suing the US government for using classified equipment out there? He said, go ahead and use it. You'll have my full support. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so we bid it to the Signal Corps that way, and yeah. the Signal Corps was so puzzled over these two contracts, two bid proposals, that they awarded a contract to both of us. Oh. That is separate contracts to each yes. of us. And uh, so we set to work. And we, we built a forward area teletype machine that used a photoelectric keyboard for reliability. Okay. They used a photoelectric tape reader for reliability. We couldn't get away with, we, lasers weren't advanced to the point where we could cut holes in tape with a laser right. yet. <laughs> And the uh, Daisy Will printer. Well, uh, by the time I left Frieden in 1969, it had become painfully clear that this wasn't going to work very well. We could not get decent life out of those Daisy Wheels. There was a little error in this 50 microsecond calculation. Um, as we dug into it, and uh, began looking at things with a microscope and a strobe light, mm -hmm. we were able to see that as soon as the hammer contacted the character, the character stopped moving. The acceleration of that hammer was so great that it glued the character to the face of the hammer, which carried it for the rest of the, oh, probably three quarters of a millisecond travel time to get it into contact with the paper. So instead of a 50 microsecond bend, we were dealing with a, a bend that was many, many times larger yes, than that. Many times. So these machines were spoke breakers. They would last, they would last a few days. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it just wasn't to go. Wow. We delivered our products to the Signal Corps. We got paid for them. We had put more money in it than they paid us, but that was all right. That's the way it goes. So on that airplane with Andy, trying to figure out what to do about our business plan, it you was had a lot of experience clear with to Daisy me, Wheel printers. It, yeah, it was clear to me that uh, if his servo techniques had the ability to stop that character on position and then print it, that we would have a machine that would not be a spoke breaker. Right as opposed to just constant, the constant rotation. So it was as simple as that. It was, let's, uh, let's, stop the, let's stop the character to print it, and the question is, can it be done? Can you do it? Right. So he did some scratching on the back of the envelope and said, I think we can run it at 30 characters a second. Oh, that's great. I love it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I loved it too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, Pete Redfield and Gary Friedman financed our company, Diablo Systems, and we opened the doors for business in August 1969. Okay. 
And Andy set right to work designing the uh, Diablo Series 30 disk drive. Ah, okay. And uh, we did that one first because he had the most, he had recent relevant experience. He had worked on them at Honeywell. He had done the one at Frieden without the TAC, with the TAC generator. And now the innovation is uh, getting rid of the TAC generator and packaging in a much more compact form. So that was kind of duck soup form, rolling off a log, as it were. And uh, we shipped our first Series 30 disk drive uh, just about a year after we opened the doors. Okay. A one-year gestation period. Now, and what were the specs on that? Say it again? What were the specs? Oh, it um, had a uh, capacity of 1.1 megabytes, okay. where IBM was using that same cartridge with a capacity of 750 or so kilobytes. Okay. It had a latency time, track to track latency was 20 milliseconds. Um, the disk spun at 1500 RPM, uh, and it had uh, virtually an infinite life expectancy. Okay. One of the neat things about this product in terms of selling it was a demonstration that we could make. We had it rigged up for demo purposes with uh, uh, recording and playing back stuff and um, showing an error count. Mm -hmm. And it would run there for you know days at a time without making an error. And that was in itself impressive. But what really turned on prospective customers was the, the drive, this drive, yep. is sitting on the, the counter. We'll lift up one corner of the drive about two inches. Now, of course, that's putting a twisting strain on it. Right. No errors. And then we take our finger away and the thing would crash down on the table. No errors. Then they'd say, well, shit, there's something wrong with your, <laughs> your sensing device. So then we'd go in and uh, bring our finger near a point in the circuitry and the arrow would go way up. So, you know. Yep. That's a great, that was demos a like that are wonderful. Demo. <laughs> That's very good. Well, we shipped the first of these uh, about a year after we started the project. And uh, guess who we shipped it to? Well, of all the people that were involved in mini computers, who do you think might have been the most likely to want to try this out? Digital? Yeah. And guess who was in charge of peripheral equipment at Digital? Grant Severs. Grant Severs was our very first customer. You're kidding. I am not kidding a bit. <laughs> I love it. He'd been following the project for uh, several months. He'd been visiting us to see how it was yeah. coming along and so on. Um, we had a, a we had, um, appointed a regional sales manager named uh, Dick Harrison uh, back in New England, and he, had, he was acquainted with digital people and had been talking this up to, to Grant, and Grant had come out on several visits. Is it that? So he, that is fascinating. He kind of followed it through its uh, incubation. And they ordered 600 of them from us, and that was enough to tide them over until they were able to build their own. And that gave them, that gave you That gave us nice. our start. And our second unit went to our uh, UK licensee. We had established a licensee in the UK, Data Recording Instrument Company. And uh, for a number of years, they were producing our stuff over there. Hmm. Now, what year was this first shipment? That'd be 1970. Okay. It's uh, early, probably early fall 1970 that that went to Grant. Did you ever send it, sell any to Data General? Oh, yeah. yeah. Data That's General what I became. Um, Data General replaced DEC as our most important customer. Oh, because, yeah. DEC, and they didn't build our own. They did not build. Either for a long time or ever, I don't know which. I don't think they built that product when they got started doing vertical integration. Yeah. I believe they built the 10 platter. Oh, yeah. The washing machine. With 2314. The, yes, yeah. with the replaceable, right. removable disc right. pack. Oh, one more, that reminds me, one more comment on the disk drive, the 2311 that Andy developed at uh, Friedman. Two more comments. One is, a contract with Harvey Friedman never materialized. 
because the 2314 came in and we were a 2311. So <laughs> okay. he, he, he did us a very good service, but uh, uh, didn't end up as a customer. But uh, I bumped into a, uh, a, a guy named uh, Roger Johnson, who had been the, who was the manufacturing VP at Frieden. I bumped into him at the airport uh, two or three years after we had gotten Diablo fired up. And I asked him, "Hey, Roger, how did the uh, how did the uh, uh, disk drive that Andy designed at uh, Frieden work out?" Now, this guy was the one that was sitting in that group of ten or eleven people who killed the project in January '69. Yes. And he said, "You know, that thing was a real surprise." He said it was the easiest product to put into production that this company had ever seen. <laughs> he said. Well, it just sailed right in. There was no problem. It, it was really clean. Just and it was, really well designed. Yeah, it had the cost of manufacture was low. Everything was perfect about it. Roger Johnson went on to become the uh, uh, CEO of Western Digital, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. We've got a bunch of interesting alumni from these companies. Yeah, clearly. Well, let's see. I guess I was talking about Walter Johnson, who. Uh, uh, subsequently was uh, CEO of Western Digital, mm -hmm. was with them for many years. Very successful business. Uh, we had another fellow at Frieden, uh, Farouk Arjani, was in the product planning department when I was there. And he started a word processor company and uh, did very well with that. Mm -hmm. Well, there have been quite a few. At Diablo, uh, the first uh, man that headed up Diablo sales and marketing was Sam Weekend, whom we got out of Honeywell. He'd been Western Regional Manager for Honeywell, but uh, had left Honeywell to join some uh, smaller company in, in uh, Colorado. He loved skiing, mm -hmm. but um, I guess that hadn't worked out to his satisfaction, so he came back to the Bay Area and joined us at Diablo. He subsequently became the uh, Marketing, VP, marketing and sales VP at Tandem Computers, worked with uh, Jimmy Trebig. Oh, and, yes. Uh, was instrumental in achieving their $4 or $5 billion success. And um, my manufacturing VP at uh, Diablo was Bob Marshall, who also joined Tandem and became one of the three members of the Troika at the, at the head of uh, Tandem. So we, we had... Uh, you hired some Fairly very good people. illustrious you alumni. You found some very good people. <laughs> One of them that I'll talk a little bit about a little later is uh, David Lee, who was a young engineer that uh, joined us at Frieden while I was there, and uh, subsequently came over to uh, to Diablo and worked on the printer at Diablo. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a year after we. Uh, sold Diablo to Xerox, he left us and started a company called Cume oh, yeah. that uh, copied the Daisy Wheel printer and made quite a success out of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah, um, let's see. So where are we? Yes, where are we? Uh, all right. We've, we've uh, finally got uh, Diablo financed. Uh, we got the first product out, uh, the Series 30 disk drive shipped to... Mm -hmm. uh, deck. And uh, in the fall of 1970, Andy was uh, sufficiently free from responsibilities of designing the disk drive to turn his attention to the printer question. So this is where the back of the envelope uh, okay. analysis was going to be checked out. Right. And his first step in uh, looking at the printer was to uh, arrange to get uh, a computer in-house at uh, Diablo. And uh, Gary Friedman's brother happened to have uh, an 1130 that he had purchased and was no longer using. He had an accounting business. So he leased us his 1130. That led to some ruckus with the IBM service department. Were they going to uh, honor the service contract on it right. because they didn't own it. Yes. And it took a 
regional manager at IBM to get that straightened out, but they did. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the amusing things here was that as Andy started trying, well, no, just trying to install this 1130 turned into a bit of a marathon. Each time they'd start it up, it would run for a little while and then smoke would start to come out of it. Oh. And that happened a couple of times. Okay. Uh, before uh, a higher level service person <laughs> was brought in. Um, what was happening was that the voice coil actuator for the single platter 2315 drive, yes. disk drive, of the 1130 was um, being toasted. Now why would a voice coil in a disk drive get toasted? Yes. The answer turned out to be that the accountant had installed his computer with a line printer. But we didn't need a line printer, so we had just uh, decided to use the uh, console serial printer, an IBM Selectric yes. typewriter, okay. awesome. and dispense with the line printer expense. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out that um, the software didn't get changed accordingly, and consequently, when you turned the thing on, the disk drive would spend its time looking for the software that controlled that printer that wasn't there. And after uh, some length of time, an hour or two or whatever, the voice coil was hot enough that the disk that bur burst into flames. <laughs> Smoke came pouring out and so on. It took them a little while to find that and they had to replace, uh, they did three replacements of voice coils before they got it straight. But it clearly was not, the, so that drive you could write a program oh, yeah. for that drive that yeah. would burn up, yep. for that computer that would yep. burn up the drive. Yep. We were very happy uh, to be able to say at that point that that was not possible with the Diablo Series 30 disk drive. <laughs> you could work it as hard as you wanted. Do with any, any, any aberration yep. program. <laughs> yes, okay. Well, uh, after uh, Doing a couple of months of work with the 1130, Andy brought a uh, printout, uh, which was set up as a curve, into my office, plotting uh, a margin, a safety margin, versus print speed. And at 30 characters a second, it was showing about a 40% safety margin. And it was um, crossing the zero safety margin axis at somewhere around 55 characters per second. So from this we concluded that we had done well in choosing our target spec speed for this printer, 30 characters a second, mm -hmm. double the advertised rate for the, for the Selectric, more than double its actual speed, and uh, still plenty of safety margin. And if we needed to later on, we'd probably be able to push it up to higher speeds if competition set in. But at that point, there was no competitive pressure to do that. So we stuck with 30 characters a second as our design goal, and Andy buckled down to designing the product. Okay. Subsequently, some people did put out Daisy Wheel printers, uh, advertised at speeds up to 55 characters a second. Mm -hmm. But they didn't last on the market very long. So I think everybody was flirting with that same limit. Okay. Wow. Now, um, I've already described the essential elements in Andy's design of that uh, high-type uh, printer, really. Mm -hmm. It used his digital servo with the bifiler type pickoff for uh, positioning based on the zero crossings. Um, and um, that just translated over into the printer very nicely. In the case of the print wheel, we had 96 positions, mm -hmm. so it had 96 cycles of the pattern on the, yeah. on the little printed circuit card. And in the carriage positioning, you know, I've forgotten just exactly how finally that was subdivided. But it was the same sort of thing. So he used this, the same servo principles in both cases. Wow. And in both instances, he used, he successfully used the uh, differentiation of that linear portion of the sinusoidal curve to get the servo stabilization. We didn't have the weight of the tack generator to, to, to uh, foul up the positioning of the print wheel. Yeah. 
yeah. or to slow us down on positioning the carriage. It was just great. Everything worked out. And it really worked well. And the net result of it all was that we had maybe a dozen moving parts in this product. Whereas that IBM Selectric typewriter had something like 600 moving parts in it. Really? So an IBM Selectric in a high intensity application like a word processor that's banging away hour after hour or a computer console printer that's generating long reports hour after hour. Those things, they were lucky to get uh, a few weeks operation out of it before the thing really needed serious service attention. But the uh, Daisy Wool printer with these electronic positioning methods would run for years without requiring service. So when did you ship the first uh, one of these? When was this, when did this product um, get finished? As I remember? said, Andy started the design on it in uh, November 1970. And in February 1972, we had a press party at the St. Regis Hotel in New York City where we demonstrated it to the public for the first time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it was a big hit. It was a big hit. Well, it would be. Now, uh, I say that we demonstrated it to the public for the first time at that press party, but there was one sneak factor on that. In the plane in which we were flying east, to do this demo. Sitting across the aisle from me was Bob Noyce. All right. And Bob was working on a big sheaf of papers that turned out to be related to uh, a first IPO, an IPO for uh, Intel. Okay. I think, if I remember correctly, they were doing something like 20 or 30 million a year revenue at that point, and getting ready for an IPO. So we had interesting conversation along the way. What are you going to New York for to talk with uh, uh, financial types? What are you going to New York for to do a press party on our new printer? Oh, tell me about the printer. Um, so we said so long at the, at the airport, Kennedy. And uh, we get to the St. Regis Hotel, and as we're registering, Bob Noyce walks in. He's also in the St. Regis Hotel. Okay. So he said, hey, we're going to be setting up this demo uh, as soon as we get settled in our rooms, why don't you come on up? So around 10 or 11 o'clock at night, he comes up to the ballroom where we're setting this stuff up, and he got the first first public demonstration of the day. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Very good. That's great. And that's my claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, wonderful. Wonderful. It turned out in later years that um, he was an avid pilot. Mm, yes, pilot. I know he flew his own jet. Yes, he had a uh, Aero Turbo Commander, Turbo Aero Commander. Okay. And it turned out uh, in conversation with him at various uh, industry events that um, he was also very interested in seaplanes. And uh, I had bought a uh, twin engine seaplane in 1973, I guess it was, 73, um, a Piaggio Royal Gull. Okay. Uh, it's a five-place flying boat. Fabulous airplane. There's a picture of it in the room here somewhere. Well, anyway. Um, so we had fun exchanging views on seaplanes. Okay. And he was very interested in uh, a Republic CB. There was a conversion that had been developed by, an engine conversion that had been developed by a guy up in Seattle that would double the power of the thing and so on. Okay. So one day we, we, he and I got together and we met out at the Concord Airport. He flew his turbo commander over and I had my sea gull, sea um, fly, royal gull there. And uh, we swapped flights. So he let me fly his turbo commander for a bit and I let him fly my, my uh, seaplane for a bit that ah. Sunday morning. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, that was fun. Oh, well, um, you know, Reed Dennis has uh, oh, does a great he flyer. Yeah. And of course, he's, he's got a Grumman loves Albatross. Seat. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Which is a uh, amazing classic. I've never gotten a flight out of it. My connection with Reed Dennis is that we have the same barber. And that barber has introduced us. And uh, I got a loan of the videotape that uh, Reed did on his Around the World flight. Oh, yes. Okay. And. Uh, Someday, Reed's going to take me for a ride in his albatross, but I don't know just when. Anyway, um, okay. 
Back to yeah, back to the story. Back to the Diablo. Where are we? Well, we have just uh, uh, we have just announced the that's printer. right, and started shipping the following month. Yep. Okay. Now, um, we had had some inquiries about printing technology from Xerox. The mm -hmm. uh, first contact was in December of the preceding December seventy one. And it uh, had all the flavor of developing into an OEM type of relationship. So we were nurturing it and um, sworn to secrecy and all that. They were sworn to secrecy. We were sworn to secrecy, yes. so forth. But after we made our public announcement, Xerox opened up and said, uh, we really don't want an OEM arrangement. We'd like to buy your company. OK. Now, you had, were not public at this time. No, no. Where? You had no uh, IPO. Okay. Our um, ITEL Corporation at that point held about 65% of the company. Okay. Sutter Hill had 5% as a finder's fee, <clears throat> and the rest was distributed among employees. Well, um, it turned out that uh, ITEL had gotten into some financial difficulty. They had acquired another company. Oh, God, I can't remember its name. Maybe it'll come to me later. It was a company that had been building uh, small computer uh, machines like the CompuTyper, uh, all yeah. electric CompuTyper, and word processors. And uh, were selling primarily in Europe. Uh, it was an American company, US company. And they had uh, quite an extensive field service organization you know, products that had this electric typewriter in them had to have a pretty extensive field service organization. So these fellows um, had something like 275 people in their service group, and that was of great interest to ITEL. So ITEL had acquired them at a point when, they, when that operation was losing something like uh, half a million dollars a month. And uh, ITEL being formed from... Uh, people with a very strong IBM orientation, mm -hmm. had felt that um, by uh, putting an IBM-trained manager in charge of it, they'd be able to straighten out the mess. So they hired uh, IBM's uh, branch manager in Seattle to come down and take charge. Dura Business Machines was the name wow. of the company. So they hired, um, I've forgotten his name, from Seattle to uh, take over as president of Dura. And over several months, he got it to the point where it was just about break even. But then uh, there was a turn down in, in general business in 71. And by the end of 71, uh, this Dura business operation was losing something like a million dollars a month, back into the loss uh, column. And uh, when the annual audit was done, it turned out that there was a huge inventory problem, that apparently Dura US had been shipping product to Europe and treating it as a sale, and Europe had been warehousing it. It's that very famous accounting problem that so many companies run afoul of. When is a sale a sale? A sale, sale exactly. Yeah, well, they were in it in spades. So the accountants were saying to Pete Redfield, um, you know, uh, you've got something like $12 million of goodwill on your balance sheet from the acquisition of Dura. And um, we don't think we're going to be able to give you a letter unless you can clean that up. So Pete's solution to that was grab this Xerox offer. We'll sell Diablo to Xerox. Uh, our 65% of the proceeds will more than cover the $12 million. And uh, we'll be free of that onus. They could just shut down Dura. <laughs> right, and just shut down Dura. Yeah. So that's, that was the thrust at that end of the equation. We'd love to sell you guys. So we had a management meeting among our VPs and Diablo saying, do we want to go along with this or not? Well, um, what could we do to stop it? The only mechanism we could think of to stop it, reasoning wasn't going to do it, was to say we'd go on strike. That we'd, we'd hand in a mass resignation if they're going to sell the company. That would probably stop it. 
Well, Xerox, the buyer would. Yeah, Xerox yeah. would decide not to buy it. If yeah, they get the team if they weren't getting any, any people. Well, we were debating this point in this group, yes. and um, our financial VP, John Dugary, who had come to us out of Price Waterhouse, he'd been six years a tax accountant. Now he's really enjoying this startup environment. Right, yes. It was really a fun company. There were 150 of us at this point, and it was going like gangbusters. Yeah, it was okay. Really great. Have a good time. That's the fun time in a company. Yes, exactly. John draws himself, John subsequently became a venture capitalist, Dugary Wilder, et cetera. Dugary Wilder, John, so whatever. Um, John drew himself up full height and said, you guys are absolutely crazy to consider selling this company. In another three years, it's going to be worth so much money that you're crazy to consider letting it go at this point in time. Well, at the other end of the spectrum was my partner, Andy Gabor. Remember, Andy had left Hungary at the end of the freedom. He was a hunger, he was a radar expert in Budapest. And then the Hungarian Revolution came along, and he starts toting a submachine gun, and he's a freedom fighter. And then the Russians move in with their tanks. Andy and his wife escape. They swim the Danube River with just the shirts on their backs and manage to get over here. So Andy has never had a penny in his life, except day to day what he can earn. So the prospect of converting this piece of paper that he had into a substantial amount of money was very attractive to Andy. And he stood up full height and said, the trouble with you entrepreneurs is that the bird in the bush is worth two in the hand. <laughs> So anyway, we decided to be good boys and not offer a mass resignation. And the thing, the transaction went through it. It closed. Uh, I think we signed the papers in in uh, April, and uh, stuff went into escrow and all that. And by August, I had Xerox shares instead of Diablo shares. In August of what year? Seventy-two. Seventy-two. Yeah. Wow. All right. And Andy was. Um, very pleased to have achieved some financial security for the first time in his life. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Andy and I had been having some personal differences. And um, we uh, told our new boss at Xerox, a guy named Bill Brown, who was senior vice president in charge of the special products divisions of Xerox, which included uh, the SDS acquisition that they had down in El Segundo okay. included um, a company that was uh, uh, into mammography, building machine, Xerox mammographic equipment. Andy and I approached Bill and said, um, it looks as though we're having uh, difficulties that will make it difficult for us to continue working together under the same roof. And... Um, we hope you can find a solution to this problem. <laughs> so, All right. So Bill uh, asked for two or three weeks to work on it. And the uh, ultimate outcome was pretty good, I think. Um, Andy transferred to Xerox Park. He became a staff person associated oh. with Park yeah. under George Paik. Okay. And um, I was left running Diablo. Um, let's follow Andy's career from there. Yeah, okay, that would be good. Andy, I think... Now, what was, could you, I mean, was it just purely personal, or what was sort of the tension between you and Andy in, in terms of outlook or, or th what you, wanted, yeah, to, I think what you was, wanted to do? I think it was uh, the personal chemistry had gone sour. Oh, all right. I think that was, you know, It happens. And... Uh, if you were asking who to blame, I think you'd have to say we're both to blame. Anyway. Uh, okay, so let's um, follow Andy. I think Andy functioned in kind of an advisory role, consulting, internal consulting role on a number of things throughout Xerox for a period of a year or two or three. I know that one of the people he uh, was fond of and who uh, they worked together was... Uh, John uh, Erbach. John Erbach was uh, doing pioneering work on optical disc recording. Oh, okay. 
And uh, Andy, with his disc experience, at least in terms of positioning stuff and that sort of thing, well, plus his signal processing know-how, um, was a good uh, colleague for John to work with. So I think that uh, type of thing occupied him for some time. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, ultimately, the product planning people at Xerox decided that um, the development work that Xerox was doing in the word processor field, which had been taken away from Diablo and was centered in a new organization set up down in uh, uh, Dallas, um, was covering the word processor part of the field, but that they still needed an executive typewriter to complete the office products uh, portfolio. Sweet, yes. So they asked Andy whether he could develop a silent equivalent of the IBM executive typewriter, which is a fairly noisy thing. The executive typewriter being the golf ball? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Selectric. Okay. Um, so Andy uh, undertook that project with pleasure. Okay. He set up a skunk works in a uh, small, small building over in Hayward that had been occupied by us as a Diablo headquarters for a while. Uh, he, he occupied that building. By the way, at this point, Diablo had grown to uh, something like uh, 2,500 employees. And uh, we had about 500,000 square feet of floor space in Hayward. And um, um, well, that, that's where it was when I left Diablo in 1977. And uh, it was a year or two later that um, Xerox consolidate. Xerox dropped the, uh, the disk drive product line and consolidated all the printer work in a new building that they put up down in Fremont. It was a 500,000 square foot building. And I think their sales level was up in the $400 million range. But your CFO was absolutely right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is, going to, this is going too well. Yeah. This is going to be worth a he lot more money. Right. And there was further proof of that that I'll mention a little later. Oh, I wanted to ask you one other question, if we can just roll back sure. for a second. What did, you end, what did you end up, was the value of of the Xerox stock when the acquisition uh, occurred. Xerox bought it for 30 million. For 30 million. Yeah. Which um, was puny compared with what it could have been worth a few years later. Yeah, right. But on the other hand, it was um, between five and six times prior year sales. <laughs> so that's not too shabby. No, that's not too shabby. So in one way it was a pat on the back, but in another way it was yes. uh, a steal. So Andy went to work in his skunk works. He pulled in about 25 engineers, uh, several of whom were former Frieden alumni. Yeah. And over the course of the next several years, developed a silent version, a silent executive typewriter. And the uh, culminating event of this saga was that um, they held a press party in New York City to introduce the new Xerox silent typewriter. I'm not sure it was in the St. Regis. <laughs> it probably wasn't. But they probably wasn't, but they did. But um, Andy is very good at making public presentations. He's very good at that. And so he introduced the new typewriter. And what he did was he stood behind a lectern and gave a brief lecture on uh, how it was developed and what some of the technical principles were that enabled him to achieve the kind of performance that they had attained, which included, among other things, uh, the surprising, the paradoxical idea of making the hammer heavier. Not a lighter hammer, but a heavier hammer. Oh my goodness. Which pulled the frequency, the, the frequencies came down rather than going up or something oh, like that. Okay. But the other very important element was very tight paper control to avoid having the paper act like a loudspeaker. Okay. So anyway, he completed his uh, remarks and then turned to a pedestal that was next to his lectern that had a cover draped over it, pulled the cover off, and here's an IBM executive typewriter, and he punches a go button, and the thing starts clattering away. It's making a hell of a racket. And yeah. uh, he lets that go for a half a minute or so, and then shuts it off. Then he turns to a similar 
pedestal over on the other side of his lectern, removes the cover, and just stands there. And after half a minute or so, one of the guys in the front row says, well, aren't you going to turn it on? His answer was, it's been running during this entire presentation. <laughs> I love it. He has a sense of drama, too. Doesn't he? No, yeah. wonderful. Superb. <laughs> Sounds like the Bill jo uh, you know, the, the uh, Steve Jobs uh, yeah. sort of, yeah. just that theater. Right. Oh, he yeah. understands theater. I'll That's wonderful. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah. Well, it turned out as a product that it was um, just exactly what Xerox had asked for. But nobody was buying executive typewriters anymore, at least in this country. I've heard that they sold something like 60,000 of them in France, mm -hmm. but that was about the only market they found for it. So it was a great implementation of yeah. something that turned a, a technical yeah. marvel that yeah. wasn't needed. Yeah. Uh, you could paraphrase the old expression, it was too much too late. <laughs> <laughs> too much too late, okay. Not too little too late. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh, uh, that's too bad. And so the, uh, you know, why don't we just finish up, because you and Andy don't cross again, right? Well, yes. You do. do. Mm -hmm. All right, well then. It was you um, take, yeah. several years ago. Okay. It was in, sometime in the late 80s that uh, I got a phone call from Andy. And the gist of it was, um, hi, George. Um, I've been thinking about the fact that most of us have relatively few really close friends. Oh, wow. And we shouldn't throw them away. Can we get together? <laughs> Isn't that? So, you can see how it moves me. Yeah. Uh, Andy came in to say goodbye and he said, um, when you're gone, George, who am I going to have to talk to? Okay. I mean, yeah. it, it was that It was close. that, yeah, it was that, that close. So I've seen him most recently, a few weeks ago, uh, basically uh, based on your yeah. questioning, okay. to see whether he'd be able to do this interview. And yeah. uh, he felt he just he couldn't do it. Didn't have the time. He's he concentrates on one thing at a time. And uh, when you told me that earlier in this interview, I related it to yeah. he's focused on something, and yep. it's not. That's right. He's got to make that happen. And he's very disciplined. Yeah. Well, where should we go in terms of, uh, you know, what did you, what, you want to follow the rest of Andy's career after that? Uh, I think uh, after Xerox, there is, and there then is, we'll go back to you. Yeah, we can, we can wrap that up. Um, after the executive typewriter, uh, I believe it was after that typewriter that Andy basically took retirement. Maybe he did a little consulting after that, but basically he retired. And he's devoted himself to two matters since then. One is uh, best described, perhaps, by uh, mentioning one of his observations about United States society. When he first came here from Hungary, he tells me, he was very, very disappointed to discover that there was not a string quartet on each block. Oh my goodness. Now he's a violinist okay. and uh, approaches the music with the same dedication and ferocity that he approaches technical problems. And uh, it really was a very big disappointment to him to find the paucity of musical performing interest in our country. Mm. Now, he did succeed in finding a quartet that he, he joined. He was living in Danville. And uh, I'm not sure. I think he may even have had to go into Oakland to find this quartet. But he ultimately got uh, situated and played at least weekly with these folks. Wow. So he got a partial solution to that problem. But he's had uh, 
medical issues that have, have been a problem for him. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's kind of ironic that a lot of his work in these positioning systems, like the head positioner, have revolved around stability issues. Mm -hmm. The tack generator, the differentiated slope of the curve, and so mm -hmm. forth, to stabilize the servo. Well, in playing the violin, uh, he began to develop a nervous tremor in his uh, bowing arm that would um, incapacitate him after a half an hour of play. And he consulted with all kinds of neurologists and so on and so forth, and uh, uh, basically was not able to find a solution to that problem. So he switched to the viola. And he found that the dynamic of bowing the viola was enough different from the bowing of the violin that he was able to postpone the development of a similar tremor for several years. But he had a problem. Viola music is written in a different clef or yeah. musical format yeah. notation from violin music. So he couldn't play the damn stuff reading the music. So he spent some time developing a computer program that would accept viola music and translate it into violin notation. Now he could play the viola perfectly. Isn't that wonderful? That is a wonderful story. This guy story. is a genius. Yeah. He is one of the few genuine he can, he can genius level people that I've known. And he will think about That's it and right. come up with a solution. That's right. Oh, wow. Well, I've told you about um, Andy's transition to the viola. But uh, after a few years of viola playing, uh, the tremor, tremor reappeared, now tuned to viola dynamics. And so uh, yet another transition was made. He went to the mandolin. And okay. today he's playing the mandolin. Well, I've, I, I, my mind isn't clear on whether he's had a similar shift of notation to struggle with or not. All right. But uh, he also developed a, um, a middle ear problem mm -hmm. that affected balance. And um, he's devoted a lot of attention to s studying the dynamics of these systems and uh, has worked in a collegial fashion with uh, some neuroscientists at uh, San Francisco, uh, what, what is it, University of San Francisco okay. Hospital on these questions. And, uh, apparently has made significant progress in understanding the dynamics of what's going on. But um, the observation you made earlier about his ability to dedicate himself to a problem and dig deeper than others have explored is just evident in each of these experiences. Fantastic person. That is wonderful. Um, there's one more chapter for the uh, Diablo story that I'd like to mention. Okay. And that is, um, it actually starts back at Frieden. Um, sometime in the mid-60s, oh, maybe around 66, 65 or 66, a young fellow walked in the door looking for work. His name was David Lee. And um, he seemed like a very bright young mechanical engineer. He'd graduated from the University of uh, Montana, I believe, with a mechanical engineering BS and had worked for two or three years with NCR in Dayton. But um, he explained, maybe not at the time of the interview, but later, that um, uh, he wanted to get to the West Coast because he had met a young Chinese woman uh, at UCAL Berkeley and would like to be closer to her physically. So uh, we hired him. And I remember the first job I put him on was really not a very practical task. Uh, we were designing a new adding machine, a mechanical adding machine that was going to replace the 20-year-old design that Frieden had. Um, this is a priority job from the product planning department who had the salesman consulting customers about what they needed in a new adding machine. 
<laughs> so uh, one of the uh, then fairly elderly designers of these mechanical products was going to work on his draft drafting table designing this new adding machine. And uh, I was keenly conscious that a similar project uh, had been underway when I arrived on the scene to develop the next generation square root calculator mm -hmm. under the aegis of one of the old time designers who used to work for Carl Frieden. And that product, uh, that project uh, just uh, bogged down. It was Now one of the problems here is that in preparing one of these uh, mechanical calculators for production, they used to spend literally millions of dollars for class A tooling to bang out these parts in order to achieve the nickel apart cost that I mentioned. And uh, spending 10 million bucks for the tooling on a new product was uh, not at all. Uh, it wasn't unusual. They were completely adjusted to doing that. It was yeah. just the standard practice. So here's this new adding machine coming along with the prospect of another $10 million tooling bill. And I would like to make sure the thing really works before we release it for production. So I asked David Lee to sit down and analyze the tolerance loops in the design. Well, he was discovering, you remember this play, Six Degrees of Separation? separation yes. Well, in the case of the tolerance loops in this adding machine, he had like 30 degrees of separation. And when you go through and add up the tolerance of the parts on that, it's very easy to conclude the machine will never work. So I guess that's part of the reason for the tweakers. Yes, exactly. <laughs> They'll take a particular unit of production, and regardless of what the tolerances are, and adjust those tolerances, in effect. Yeah. Well, um, so David worked on that for probably uh, several months. Uh, we finally decided to abandon the project because it would only produce negative, bad feelings. Mm -hmm. It wasn't worthwhile. And then I put him on uh, developing the uh, printing electronic calculator printer that I mentioned earlier that had the helical print wheel. Mm -hmm. And uh, he brought that along. Oh, he had been working at NCR on printer hammers. So that kind of tied in with that nicely. Anyway, when we uh, were ready to start designing the uh, uh, converting Andy's design for the printer into hardware. Um, we hired David from Frieden, mm -hmm. who joined us. And uh, I remember one of the first tasks Andy gave him was to uh, study uh, a variety of means for converting the rotary motion of the servo motor for the carriage positioning into the movement of the carriage yeah, over an 11 or 12 inch right. range. And the conclusion was that the best deal would be to use a steel cable, one of these uh, multi-filament steel cables. And the question, the challenge was to pick the, the right cable and the right diameter of pulley for it to run around and wrap around. And that was David's uh, assignment. So he tested out, did fatigue testing on probably a dozen different uh, versions of the cable and uh, tested several different uh, wheel diameters and so forth. Uh, got a good workable answer to that question. And the other uh, major issue that we assigned him was to go to work on the print wheel. In the, There were two elements involved. One was to find somebody that could create the plastic injection mold that would have the characters engraved and all that. And to pick the right material to use, which would have to be have good injection molding properties, would have to have good uh, uh, physical parameters in terms of uh, strength and stability and so forth. It would have to have reasonable wear resistance. Mm -hmm. We didn't want the period wearing out after the first few strikes. So he, he spent some significant time working on that. And uh, he also helped rig up the lab bench setup where we put this uh, how many spokes? A half a dozen spoke yeah. sample wheel uh, on a servo motor and uh, and watched it. Watched it to see how much the, the the spokes jittered and how long it would take to settle down when it was positioned, and so forth. 
So those are the kinds of things that David was doing. Meanwhile, we had uh, a crew of two or three electrical engineers working, or designers really, working under Andy's uh, direct supervision to do the circuitry for the printer. And we had another group of uh, mechanical designers, some of these old calculator designers that joined us, uh, doing the uh, physical structure for it, the chassis and the ways, all those things. Um, so that was David Lee entering the picture. Now, in 1973, about a year after Diablo had been acquired by Xerox, uh, David came in and told me that he, he wanted to resign, uh, that he was planning to team up with uh, another of our colleagues from Frieden, who was still at Frieden, a chap named Lon Israel. Um, Lon was a mechanical engineer and had previously worked for Whirlpool, so he had uh, some really good high volume production experience behind him. So the two of them set up this new company called Cume, and uh, I recall David phoning me shortly after they had set it up and assuring me that uh, uh, they had no intention of uh, building a daisy wheel printer, they were going off in some other direction. Well, that was good news from David. So uh, a year or so later, when they announced their QM Daisy Will printer, I'm a little disappointed in David. Now, it turns out that um, uh, Andy had, um, I think there were three patents that um, revolved around the positioning stuff. And um, I, I'm not sure what those also included the application of those positioning techniques in a daisy wheel printer mechanism or not. But in any event, there were at least three patents that uh, read pretty clearly on uh, what, what was, was happening. Going on. So when we learned that David was uh, building a daisy wheel printer, we uh, sat down and chatted with the then CEO of the company. Oh, Sutter Hill had financed Kuhn, okay. which was a bit of an irritant. Because yes, they had arranged financing been involved for us. with you. And one of their senior partners had been our, on our board of directors up to the point of the Xerox acquisition. Oh, who was that? Paul oh. Wise. Okay, yes. You know Paul? Mm hmm So we were a little put out with them. But anyway, um, uh, discussions with uh, the QM people about uh, uh, our patents didn't seem to make any difference to them. So we sued them for patent infringement. Mm -hmm. And that thing was uh, grinding along. Ultimately, uh, Xerox decided, rather than making a big court case out of it, which probably would have bankrupt Kuhn. In fact, uh, the Sutter Hill people told me that uh, they were really trying to figure out how to keep Kuhn alive because this whole litigation thing was uh, so oppressive to them. Mm -hmm. But um, Xerox may have been feeling quite a bit of pressure from the consent decree that they had had to sign up to with respect to their copier stuff a decade earlier. Well, whatever period of time. And so in any event, they uh, granted an appropriate license, a royalty-bearing license to Kuhn and collected royalties ever since. Now, one element of this story is that uh, Again, a few years later, I bump into a Xerox vice president in the airport. Yeah. Airports are great places for meeting right. people. Exactly. <laughs> Especially if you live at a crossroads. Right. So I bumped into one of their vice presidents, and uh, I asked him about uh, how the Daisy Will printer had played in Xerox's financial fortunes. And he told me that um, Xerox had collected more dollars in royalties based on Andy's patents than they had from all of their copier patents, than the royalty dollars they had collected on all their royalty patents over the years. Okay. Well, that was a surprise. That is a surprise. But uh, they had something like 50 or more licensees around the world. And, yeah. Well, clearly, he, you know, the 
Yeah. He did a thorough job of patent of cover of doing patent coverage. Well, wanted to use that interestingly technique. enough, when Diablo was uh, independent, we had used a patent firm in San Francisco to file our applications. And after we teamed up with uh, Xerox, uh, I had some serious conversations with the Xerox patent people back east, uh, headquartered in Washington, saying that we really needed a patent attorney on site at Diablo. And finally, after several, several months of harangue, they did assign a guy named Barry Smith to us. And um, Barry took a look at the then existing patent applications and concluded that there was more that could be done with the inventive subject matter. And so he refiled one or two of these cases and uh, substantially increased the coverage that we had over the coverage we had obtained through the uh, local law firm. I think the difference there probably is that when a local law firm is working on this sort of thing for a company, uh, their goal is to get it done as quickly as they can and at, at a reasonable level of expense for the client so that he'll keep coming back to them. Yes. And getting the patent is more important than getting a perfect patent. Yes, than getting really But when you've got a clients. company employee like Barry Smith, uh, his career is going to depend on really getting the broadest coverage and making the most of that patent. Mm -hmm. So he discovered some really substantial improvements that could be made in that patent structure and achieved them and uh, it uh, contributed to the result I've described. Now, uh, why am I going into all this? Because well, unfortunately... You're, you're, you're going to aren't you going to tell me one about what you did after Xerox? Oh yeah, you? we'll get to that. Oh, okay. Good. But um, I, wanted, I wanted to complete this David Lee story. Oh, good. Um, I'm kind of irritated with David. Now, in the first place, David's... I always thought David was a neat guy. I enjoyed him personally. I enjoyed working with him. I thought he was a fine engineer. Um, the girlfriend in, uh, in, at UCAL Berkeley uh, didn't last long, and his parents, who were then in Argentina, heard about it. Oh, okay. Uh, they flew up here and said, uh, we are going to select a bride for you. We'll give you an appropriate bride, oh, not okay. just some pickup at University of California. Okay. So they did. They arranged for a bride to come over from Taiwan, and uh, she arrived on day one. And on day two, she and David were married in the church in Hayward. <laughs> uh, this is oh, the Chinese way. Yes, I understand. And uh, they're still happily married, as far as I know. And they live in a very fine house a couple of miles over this way on a ridge. Okay. So. All right. <laughs> but there's one thing. Uh, I'm disappointed with uh, the... Uh, PR people that David fell in with. Yes. Because they, over the years, have promoted the idea that David was the father of the Daisy Wheel printer. And I can illustrate that with a paragraph from this recent publication. Okay. This is the book by Iris Chang called The Chinese in America. All right. It's really quite a book. It. Uh, it gives you a horrifying story, really, of how America treated this foreign population that began flowing in here in significant numbers around 1840, and who subsequently became the key to getting the Transcontinental Railroad right. built, built. much of the Transcontinental And uh, going on since then, they're really an oppressed people. They've got lots of reasons for feeling very badly about the way they were treated. However, um, uh, this is a section of this book that touches on David Lee. Okay, good. The author has interviewed him, or his PR agent. Um, in 1969, several employees at Frieden, and they've misspelled Frieden, uh, left to form their own company, Diablo, and Lee decided to join them. Well, Lee joined us in uh, early 1971, not in 1969, yes. when the company was founded. It was a radical move at the time. 
Well, at the time he joined us, we had one hell of a hot product line in our disk drive that uh, had produced the revenues, which multiplied by six, gave us uh, the price that Xerox is willing to pay for the company. Okay. It was a radical move at the time for the majority of Taiwanese arrivals in the early 1960s aspired to become professors, a career deemed both prestigious and secure. Those who did not plunge into academia tended to work as scientists or engineers at large commercial companies like IBM or Bell Laboratories. In David's memory, there were perhaps no more than a thousand Chinese American engineers in Silicon Valley, and most of them were wage-earning professionals, not capitalists. Very few dared to create their own companies. At the Diablo startup, Lee developed the first Daisy Will printer for mass production. In 1972, the Xerox Corporation, avidly seeking a product to compete with IBM Ball printers, bought Diablo for $28 million, turning David into a multi-millionaire. Now, that is bullshit. Yeah. That is he bullshit. He just didn't have enough stock. He didn't have enough stock to, to get that kind of money. Yeah. And he did not develop the Daisy Will yeah, printer. of course he didn't. Now, you could be generous to David and say, well, he developed it for mass production. So maybe finding the right cable uh, was a contribution to mass production. But his name is not but the, the fundamental essence, The essence of this machine is the positioning technology that made the Daisy Wheel a practical printing instrument. And that was Andy Gabor's contribution. So it, I've, I'm very resentful at David. Uh, for letting that stuff sort of like thing. this yeah. that detracts from Andy's yeah. um, rightful dues, rightful you know? position, yeah. yeah, that he figured out the scheme, yeah, for doing. So I'm very happy to have this opportunity to put that feeling on the record. All right, very good. Thank you very much, good. Gardner Hendry, and thank you very much, Computer History Museum, right. for making that possible. Okay, good. Well, um, after five years with Xerox. Oh, I've got another amusing story. Okay, great. We closed the deal with Xerox, signed the papers. It was about a foot high stack of papers. Today they're probably 10 feet high, but in 1972 it was about that high. We signed those papers at the ITEL offices in the Embarcadero Center building in San Francisco on a Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. On Monday morning, about 9 o'clock, uh, I got a call from the front desk at uh, Diablo saying, there's a gentleman from Rochester here to see you. He says he has an appointment. Well, I look at my appointment book. I don't have any record of an appointment with anybody from Xerox. So I say, well, I don't see that I have an appointment, but I'll, uh, I'll come out and get the guy and see what he wants. So I go to the lobby, and this guy introduces himself as the manager of records retention for Xerox in, situated in Rochester where their principal production facility yeah. and so on is located. Headquarters are down in White Plains. Well, uh, he's got a manual that's as thick as this notebook of mine that has my patents in it. Yeah. And that's the uh, Xerox procedures relative to record retention. And he's going to go over this manual with me and make sure we understand every detail of how we're to do things now that we're part of Xerox. So I said, uh, gee, uh, I don't have any record of your having an appointment, and I am very busy this morning. Uh, I'm not going to be able to spend much time with you, but if you like, I'll take you on a little tour of our plant. Well, he thought that was generous, so I gave him a 10-minute tour of the plant and walked him to the front door. My next move was to call Bill Brown, my new boss at Xerox, and say, what the hell is going on here? Yes. <laughs> so Bill got that fire damped out. <laughs> The next fire was the Andy Gabor, George Comstock question. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> that took a little longer. Right. Uh, but that was an interesting introduction to the life of Xerox. And what I found over the next uh, few weeks or months was that, take, take as an example a product planning meeting. Yes. Uh, at Diablo, independent Diablo, we'd sit down, there'd be four or five of us around the table talking about what does the market want, and uh, are we able to, to do that, how much is it going to cost, and so forth, and we'll reach a decision. Well, that wasn't the situation. Diablo Xerox. 
we'd sit down at a much larger conference table with 20 people around it or 30, and we'd have a long, far-ranging discussion about all the factors that are involved and agree we'd meet again in a week to have further discussion. And that would go on and on. <laughs> You've been there. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. So uh, after about five years, uh, I think Xerox was fed up with me, and I was fed up with Xerox. So they offered me a position of a senior vice president for West Coast Affairs or something like that, which would have been some kind of a consulting uh, liaison communication role. And I said, no, thank you. But I said, instead, what I want to do is start yet another company. Mm -hmm. And we have an idea for a product that um, would be a self-contained word processor product of quite modern design. Um, and uh, if Xerox would have any interest in financing such a company, uh, I'd, I'd be willing to consider that. Well, the answer is yes, we'd be very interested in looking at that. What we'd like to have you do is to go down to, um, it's not El Segundo, it's Santa Monica yes. at 9200 Sunset. There's uh, the offices of the Xerox Development Corporation, headed up by Abe Zerum, who had made a, a big name for himself in some uh, uh, optical reconnaissance work in a company that had been acquired by Xerox. Okay. So I go down and talk with Abe, and he's all full of generalizations about how wonderful it would be to work together and so forth, and I want you to sit down with my lieutenant, forgotten his name, and work out the details. Well, about five months later, <laughs> I had three, uh, four other guys involved in this with yeah. me. We had uh, a chief engineer, a manufacturing guy, a uh, sales guy, and an HR guy, and the five of us were gung-ho about doing something about this. And uh, we said, let's, let's forget it. So I went back to Sutter Hill, talked with Bill Draper, and said, uh, we'd like to start a new company to build. Uh, we've changed our objective. Instead of building a word processor, which was of great interest to Xerox, but not generally speaking, We'd like to build a small business computer, ideally suited to running a company with 5, 10, 15 employees. And uh, we think we can package it in such a way that it will not be as threatening to that user as computers are today. Multiple boxes scattered around, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Bill Draper said, uh, gee, yeah, I think we can finance that. So he gave him a, left a copy of the business plan, and two weeks later, we had our box. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a little bit different than the way Xerox works. So that's how we got Durango Systems started okay. in uh, 1977. All right. And we opened the doors for business, I think it was uh, July or August of 77, and began designing a product, one of which is sitting right there. We were on uh, the startup of Durango, um, we raised our money and got going, and um, in that case, it took us another 15 months to start shipping product. And uh, how much money did you raise? To total? Uh, we had an initial infusion of a million and a half, and then we subsequently added uh, three quarters of a million to that. Um, now, the Durango. Uh, effort was directed toward b taking advantage of the microprocessors, and in fact, we used the uh, Intel um, 85, 8085 for our machine, and uh, built a unit that was uh, really substantially ahead of IBM technology by a big margin. Uh, for example, we had five-inch floppy disk drives in it that we designed our own read-write um, system for, and we were putting almost a megabyte on a five-inch floppy at a time when the industry standard was 160 kilobytes, and some of the machines were only doing 80 kilobytes. So we were way ahead. Uh, we built our own dot matrix printer for the machine, uh, 165 character second draft mode, 35 near letter quality mode. 
Um, one of the interesting um, sidelines on that was that uh, we decided to use a uh, ribbon cartridge that Hewlett Packard was using in one of their printers. So we adopted their cartridge. After we got into production, um, there was a question whether Hewlett Packard would supply those cartridges to us on an OEM basis. And I finally got a green light on that by talking with Paul Ely, E L Y, mm -hmm. who was vice president of HP in charge of their Boise, uh, Idaho operations where the cartridges were built. And he agreed to OEMing those cartridges oh, to wow. us. Oh, <laughs> wow. Which we proceeded to do for a year or two, but then ultimately we tooled up and began building our own, mm -hmm. manufacturing our own cartridges. Um, to make a long story short, um, we had bitten off more than we could chew, really. We had not only the entire hardware system to put together, and we were building our own printer, but um, uh, we also had to develop our own software. We put out a contract with a group in Southern California for an operating system, and they just didn't perform for us. So we wrote our own DOS. And then uh, uh, we needed to have BASIC on it. Well, we wrote our own dialect of BASIC that took advantage of our operating system. And then uh, we needed some application packages. So we bought a set of uh, uh, packages that had been designed for one of the smaller members of the Data General uh, product line and modified them to run on our machine. We designed our own word processor, built our own uh, word processor software package, and so on. Um, ultimately, we did add CPM to the machine so that foreign software could be brought over onto it. Um, of course, this was starting in 1977, and, uh, well, there just wasn't a lot of stuff available when you come right down to it. Um, we got a spreadsheet through the CPM route that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's... Uh, uh, come back into my mind from time to time as I think back over this era, concerns uh, a certain airplane flight. It seems that in 1981, a team from uh, IBM's Boca Raton operation flew out to Monterey, California to visit with Gary Kildall, who was running, uh, what was it, Data Record, uh, DRI, Data Re Digital Research, Research Inc. Digital Research, yes. And um, he had the CPM operating system. And IBM was going to talk with him about putting CPM on their not yet announced PC. Well, um, Gary was uh, uh, an avid amateur pilot and uh, flew a Pitts acrobatic biplane, which is kind of the ne plus ultra of biplanes in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out that the day these IBMers were going to be arriving, was absolutely perfect weather, and my understanding is that he went flying that day and left one of his subordinates to deal with IBM. What I've heard is that they were so insulted by this that they just turned around at the front door, marched back to their corporate jet, and flew up to Seattle to visit with the son of a woman who was on their board of directors, I believe that was the connection, um, to talk with him about uh, an operating system. And he said, oh, sure, he could supply them with an operating system, knowing that a friend of his across Puget Sound somewhere uh, had something that he thought he could buy that would probably uh, be able to go into the thing. Didn't he pay $75,000 for I don't know how much he paid. Basic he, software yes. package that got Microsoft really on the yeah, map. Yeah, turned into DOS. Well, uh, what's the thought that runs through my mind? Here was an airplane flying practically overhead when we were on North First Street, San Jose with Durango. And seated in that plane were four or five people who, had they landed at the San Jose airport and taken the four or five mile ride up to our plant on North First Street, would have seen a disk operating system that didn't require a go-to to a numbered statement. It could go to a literal. And they had lots of other advantages. Yes. And not only that, it was not a dream in somebody's eye. It was actually operating on a machine. It was controlling disk drives. We had a hard disk on the machine at that point. 
Uh, I mean, that would have been a perfect solution for IBM. My gosh, we might have even sold a company to them for the price that, I, that uh, Xerox paid for Diablo. Yes. <laughs> so that was one of the uh, ironies in, in our yeah. life at Durango. We just didn't stay close enough to the pulse of the industry, uh, is my excuse for it. So yeah. we didn't know what was going on. And a year or two later, uh, that elephant foot of the PC really squashed us at Durango. Um, in spite of all that, uh, Durango did manage to produce and sell something approaching 10,000 of these machines. And uh, Oh, that's impressive. Uh, last time I talked with a chap who was our service manager, Terry Purcell, uh, he still had several of them running out in the field. And that's uh, what, well, 15, 20 years later. So it was uh, a product that we could be proud of. And it was also a company we could be proud of. You know, peak employment got up to about 150 people. And it, it was one of these uh, low politics situations. In fact, there have been several reunions of Durango folks to get together for a weekend just to see each other and enjoy each other and talk over old times and so on. So it was kind of a lasting phenomenon. Finally, it was a very lasting phenomenon for me because um, at about the time that we turned profitable with this company, oh, by the way, one of the things I'm really very pleased about in looking back over the years is that in both the case of Diablo and in the case of Durango, we ran those businesses within 1% of what we had been predicting in our business plan for expense and revenue for the first couple of years. We really tracked perfectly what, what our predictions had been. How many, how many companies can make that claim? The uh, um, most and we achieved, venture business plans. We achieved profitable operation at precisely the month predicted. No, I'm wrong about that. In the case of Diablo, we had predicted profitability at 24 months. And in fact, we had a huge loss at 24 months. In fact, a much larger loss than we had in the 23rd month. And Paul Wythes of Sutter Hill, who was on our board, uh, pulled me aside and said, look, this is a very serious situation. We've got to really cut expenses to the bone here. I mean, this thing is going downhill very rapidly. And I said, Paul, please don't worry about it. Next month, you'll see that everything is all right. And sure enough, the following month, we had our profit. It was one month late on achieving profitable operation. What was the reason? Well, we had filled up the we had filled up the postage meter <laughs> and a number of other things to put the expense into the 24th month instead of the 25th month because of some obscure contract condition that I've forgotten right now. But right. It, it, there was an advantage for us in, it to in, do that in yes. having it turn out that way. So Paul worried unnecessarily about okay. profitability. Anyway, both these companies did very well in that respect. Um, when Durango turned profitable, as expected, um, we had a problem that uh, many of the people who had joined us had accepted what you might call less than fair market value wages for their job uh, in the expectation that when we turned profitable, we'd correct that situation. And so we set about correcting it. But we quickly discovered that uh, some of these folks had very unrealistic expectations. So we thought some outside help would be desirable. And uh, one of our uh, people who was working in the HR area uh, had worked uh, just previous to joining us with a very bright woman who was uh, uh, heading up HR activity at uh, ESL and uh, whom our person knew was uh, planning to start her own private practice. So she recommended that we talk with her about coming in to give us a hand. Uh, to make a long story short, she came. We successfully got over the hump of the problem of having profitable operation, and she married me. <laughs> that was a number of years ago, and it's the best thing that happened to me in my life. <laughs> so I think that kind of winds up the story. Uh, well, no, not quite. Um, Durango did 
well, it operated profitably for about a year, and then the arrival of the PC, and also pricing pressure where people expected to pay like $1,500, such as an Apple cost, instead of paying the 7,500 to 40,000 that one of our systems cost, um, made life very difficult for us. And uh, it gradually slid down, and ultimately the venture capitalists uh, decided I wasn't the person to run it anymore. They brought in a new guy from Memorex, poured a lot more money in, and a year later folded into another company that was having trouble that they owned. And uh, a year after that, that all went down the tubes. So we, we suffered the fate that's not uncommon in this entrepreneurial stuff. Well, I'm going to put in another plug for me. I've worked for four startup situations in my life. One was Potter. There were 80 people when I started and 800 when I left and went on growing another four times after that. Then there was uh, Diablo that I started, Durango that I started, and uh, I'll also make a brief mention of Network General, which was the last company I worked for, where I was employee number four and enjoyed a very pleasant, wonderful five years with uh, Len Schustick and uh, Harry Saul in that environment. It was a great experience. Wonderful way to polish off a career. So I had four startup situations, and for me, three of them were successful. So I like to claim I was batting 750, and that's not too bad. That's not bad at all in the now, um, multiple startup world. I, I joined Network General as employee number four in 1986, a few months after they had opened the doors for business. I, I came in as, um, at first, as a volunteer consultant to help them get started. Now, how did you get connected with them? Oh, Harry had uh, interviewed um, the, our manager of software development from Durango and uh, was calling me on a reference check. And we had a really interesting phone conversation and decided to have lunch. We had lunch several times over the course of the next couple of years. And then I didn't hear from him for several months. I did get a call then in which he said, hey, uh, I've started a new company. Uh, would you like to come over and see our product? Well, of course. Of course so, you're going to do that. So I went over to have lunch with him, which was pizza with Harry, Len, and Harry's wife, Carol. Okay. And a view of the first sniffer, which was there in a compact suitcase luggable package. They had put their own network card, they had put an Ethernet network card in and had put their own software on for the sniffer function. And they demonstrated it to me. I didn't know a thing about networking. I had not been involved at that point in networking. So I thought, gee, this would be a great chance to learn something about local area networks. Harry, um, I've had some experience with uh, startups. If you could use another pair of hands around here a day or two a week for the next two or three months, I'd be glad to pitch in. Well, he was a little bit puzzled about this offer. Is this guy a spy or something? Yeah, right. But uh, after a little consideration, he said, well, why not? Come on. So I joined them, and uh, the one or two days a week quickly turned into five days a week, and I was setting up their sales operation using manufacturer's reps, which was a bit off the track at that point. But it worked out very well. In fact, they ended up buying out about half of their reps and converting them into direct sales offices. This is two or three years downstream. But um, after I'd been there for a couple of months, Harry said, look, we'd like to have you join us as our VP of uh, uh, sales and marketing. Well, why not? It's a lot better than being president. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can concentrate on something. So I did. And uh, it was just a wonderful experience working with those people. And it was a wonderful company, you know. They started it, they opened their doors in May 86. I started working on a part-time basis in August 86, converted to full-time in November 86. We had shipped our first sniffer to a customer in September 86. We, we turned profitable on a month-to-month -month basis in January 87. Now, isn't that something? Yes. Of course, the fact is it was a software company. Yes. Their added value is software. They bought the compact machine. They bought a, a network interface card from 3Com, plugged them together. There's a manufacturing cost that's on the order of $2,600. Loaded their software onto it and sold it for 20000 
So, I mean, that was a very fine kind of business, 90% gross margin. Um, they were profitable in January 87 and continued profitable every month from then on. And they were characteristically operating at a 15% net after tax and doubling sales every year. Um, I finally retired from Network General in uh, 1991, I think it was. Yeah, I was there five years. And uh, by that time, they were doing 50 million a year and uh, still 15% net after tax. It's interesting, the last year or so I was with them, I was functioning as uh, what's called business development manager, meaning I was out looking for acquisitions and mergers. And one acquisition I recommended they consider was uh, acquiring McAfee, McAfee virus, mm -hmm. uh, antivirus stuff. And uh, McAfee at that point was, if I remember correctly, doing something like 15 million a year. Network General, meanwhile, had gone public and had an enormous valuation. And uh, sounded, seemed like a good deal because it would sell to the same customer and uh, uh, in a sense a related kind of phenomenon, mm -hmm. fixing problems. Yeah. Um, but they felt kind of uneasy about and too big a thing to take on and be difficult to manage and so on, so they didn't. But you know, 10 years later, McAfee bought Network General and paid $1.4 billion for it. <laughs> <laughs> I was no longer with the company, and by then I had sold all my stock, so. <laughs> oh, all right. You know, that's the still... principle of diversifying your investments. Yes, of course. So that's my story, and since then I've just been engaged in uh, various volunteer activities, and I love to do woodworking. Uh, I gave up private flying about three years ago. I love that. I've, I'm doing some sailing these days. That's very enjoyable. And I've gotten into uh, politics. I'm the vice mayor of Portola Valley right now, <laughs> and uh, presumably I'll be the mayor next year. So, you know, what do I feel best about myself, having a 750 batting average on entrepreneurial startups or being the mayor of Fortola Valley. I, I'll put my money on the, on the startups. Oh, that's great. So uh, I hope this has illustrated the principle I started off with, that uh, there's a thread that runs through everything. And this thread started with uh, bi-filer position pickoffs, and that ran all the way through the uh, Diablo story. And... Uh, I'm not sure whether there's such a thing in this uh, Durango machine or not. If you'd like to take a look at the Durango machine, we could do it now. Okay. Well, I just, before we do that, I just want to thank you for uh, taking the time, a uh, generous amount of your time, to uh, uh, tell your story to, uh, for our oral history project at the Computer History Museum. Well, thank you, Gardner. I suspect I've enjoyed it more than you have. You can see I do like to spout off. <laughs> so I think thanks, we both enjoyed it. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Well, let's look at the machine, okay. shall we? This is the Durango F-85. Um, it, it, was, it was well ahead of the industry. For instance, in the five-inch floppy disk drive here, we uh, designed our own read-write stuff and uh, put... 947 kilobytes on a disk at a time when everybody else was doing either 80 kilobytes or 160 kilobytes. Mm -hmm. um, we originally had two floppies in it, but uh, we very soon replaced one of the floppies with a hard drive. Mm -hmm. We started with a 5 megabyte hard drive and then went to a 10 megabyte hard drive. Um, we built our own printer. This is a uh, dot matrix printer. Mm -hmm. There's the dot matrix head. And that's a, a ribbon that just fell loose there. We started with the HP ribbon cartridge and then ultimately tooled and manufactured our own. This paper feed mechanism could handle both uh, continuous form um, fan fold uh, side punch sheets or uh, what, what's the opposite of sheet? Well, yeah, continuous or individual, form. yeah. Uh, or this mechanism could handle individual uh, cut, cut sheets. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a, quite a versatile printer, and it would handle wide formats, so you could do accounting uh, reports quite nicely. We had some auxiliaries. I don't know whether you can see it, but this is an auxiliary uh, dual 5-inch floppy drive that could be plugged into it. Mm -hmm. But more than that, if, if you were to look around at the back side here, you'd see a bunch of connectors. We could connect up to uh, four auxiliary terminals. We bought the terminals from... Uh, 
oh, what was the name of the company on Long? AD. Oh, I forgot. Yes, I remember. I, yes, there was a terminal. It was the guy company that on. became chairman of uh, Long Island Lighting Company that was running the running it. Okay. Um, so you could put five terminals with their keyboards connected into the back of this thing and have, or four terminals plus this. You could have as many as five people doing different jobs at the same time on this machine and sharing a printer. Okay. Um, they had a relatively small screen. Was that sort of the standard with it? or? Well, this was, yes, this was the standard screen. It was a nine inch screen. We used a, uh, just a pure character based uh, mm -hmm. presentation. Um, it, it was uh, legible because you're sitting reasonably close to it. Yeah. And this uh, swiveled around so that you could get a good view. And it was a angle. completely integrated physical package. That you didn't was have the to point. plug anything together. Our aim was to try to make it look enough like a typewriter so that people wouldn't be scared of it because it was a computer. Mm -hmm. Well, that was great psychological theory, but uh, it wasn't enough to overcome the appeal of an IBM name tag <laughs> on, a yes. piece of, on, on multiple pieces of equipment. All right. So that's the Durango system. And, um, Very good. I wish that plane had landed at San Jose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This was the, uh, we sold the D uh, Diablo drive in three different configurations. This okay. was just a single drive. This is two drives in the same box, both interchangeable cartridges. Mm -hmm. And this is one where we denatured the lower uh, drive so that you couldn't remove the cartridge. That became our antidote to a, uh, to a fix to a, a machine such as Iomec built that had one removable and one fixed. Ah, on the same okay. Side. Um, I didn't mention competition, but when we went into this business, there were three competitors. One was Iomec, mm -hmm. uh, whose sales and marketing function was headed up by Avery Blake, a former colleague of mine at Frieden, okay. one of the Frieden alumni. Um, another one was Kalis. Um, I've forgotten what their antecedents were. And uh, third one was a company, I believe, in Phoenix, Computer Memory Technology or something like that. And um, each one of them had one significant customer. Um, Kalis had Burroughs as a customer. Iomec had, um, I think they may have had HP as a customer. And uh, CMT, I think it was CMT, had um, Data General, I think, as a customer. But um, once we came on the market, none of them were able to get another major account. We just, uh, we just dominated it. Um, one interesting point is I mentioned the uh, business plan that we had created and then tracked very accurately. Uh, in predicting the market, we had listed 10 major account potentials, and for each one of them, our percentage estimate of the likelihood of our closing them uh, as a customer. And uh, looking at that after two years, it turned out that we only closed one of those accounts. Oh, wow. <laughs> Up to that point. Okay. But nevertheless, we made our numbers. But you made your numbers anyway. Yeah. I think we already took a quick look at yeah, this. Yeah, I think we did. This is our Japanese distributor's uh, sheet showing the cartridge and how it fit into the yeah. uh, Diablo machine. This was uh, a brochure on the Daisy Wheel printer mm -hmm. featuring the Daisy Wheel with its uh, characters and the oh, yeah. tips of the spokes. Um, this is a brochure on the Diablo, on the oh, Durango, yes. Durango machine. Very good. We uh, even demonstrated how light in weight it was by having one of our secretaries uh, pick it up, carry one of the machines. She was able to hold it just long enough for the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Did not have a giant power supply in it. Right. Um, that's pretty much it. Oh, I, I talked about CompuTypers at Frieden. Yes. This is a CompuTyper. Oh, okay. Here's the FlexaWriter with paper, tape, reader, and punch. Here's some reels for managing the tape. Mm -hmm. And down inside here is the central processor. There's a plug board not visible here that's used for programming it. And Frieden was selling these at the rate of several thousand a year. And in a sense, that was kind of the um, seed planted to generate the uh, Durango idea. Okay. So that's, uh, that's about, about the story. Now, what are, the, are those your patents down there? 
Oh, this notebook? Yeah, yeah this, this notebook? is. Uh, How many do you have uh, in this there? This is a collection of my patents over the years, my my own patents. Yeah. There are about forty of them in there. Forty patents. Yeah. There's only one of them that really collected much in the line of royalties. And uh, I guess it generated about $5 million worth of royalties. That's, that's okay. <laughs> Very good. Ampex was one of the payers. Uh-huh. 